Florence, can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Right, okay. So, uh, I think all of you can hear me now. And you can see the white board also. So, uh, we have a complete first. Uh, so, I thought to uh, revise all the theories again, as I mentioned you. A speed revision, kind of a revision uh, from the beginning. Unit one atomic structure. Okay. So I'm going to discuss the most important theory parts, right? So from the beginning, uh, that is very important for the examination uh, under this session, in this session. So uh, let's quickly revise these things uh, and uh, let's figure out and what are the things uh, we have to revise here, right? Okay. Right. Uh, unit one atomic structure. So let me uh, start from the introduction and the atomic theory. So I'm going to choose some topics. So under those topics, uh, we can quickly revise everything, right? Introduction and the atomic theory. Right. So can you remember under the introduction and atomic theory, we learn about uh, atom. What does it mean by atom, right? So the ancient definition for the atom. So first of all, uh, we have to Revise that atom, the word atom is came from uh, actually a Greek term, atomos, right? Atomos. Atomos means actually we know that this is indivisible. Indivisible. We consider those particles are uncuttable, right? Indivisible or uncuttable particles. So that's the uh, mean of the atomos. So later this atomos term came for the atom. So in ancient time, they were thinking that the matter is made by atom. We know that uh, everything in this world can be divided into two parts, two main parts, matter and the energy, the fundamental particle of the matter they considered as the atom. So the atom term came from the atomos, right? Atomos means uh, indivisible, uncuttable particles. As the first atomic theory, the first atomic theory as a theory, uh, who represented the first atomic theory? The first person is actually John Dalton, right? John Dalton. So uh, we discuss about the atomic theory, John Dalton's atomic theory. So the main concept of the John Dalton's atomic theory was, right? John Dalton's atomic theory. Main concept was, what, what was the main concept? Main concept was actually, uh, he considered, he represented a model for that atom. Atomic model, John Dalton's atomic model. We are going to revise the atomic models of from the beginning. So John Dalton, right? so Dalton assumed that atom is look like So the goal of the atom presented by John Dalton. So goal is uh, atom is uh, uncut. That is the particle, the ultimate particle we can find in matter. So that was the John Dalton's atomic theory, right? So under the introduction atomic theory, we discussed mainly about these things. And, uh, uh, I told you that my Faraday. So this one very carefully. Uh, these are very important. Michael Faraday and some of the scientists they conducted some experiments on the electricity, right? 
they conducted some experiments on the electricity so they tried to send the current electricity they tried to pass the current electricity through the solid medium and the they successfully conducted those experiments and they have proven that through the current uh, through the solid medium or liquid medium current electricity can pass right and some of the scientists actually tried to pass the current electricity through the gas medium right so i uh, uh, what accidentally accidentally they found the some of the negatively charged particles when they are conducting the ex this experiment that experiment is known as what cathode ray experiment right so the main topic right the first main topic that we discuss under the atomic structure is cathode ray experiment right i believe you can uh, remember these things if you can't remember these things quickly revise these things cathode ray experiment right can you remember who are the scientists actually conducted the cathode ray experiment who are the scientists the first name is actually j j thompson j j thompson right let's quickly revise the names j j thompson and then julius plucker julius plucker then wilhelm hitoff wilhelm hitoff write the names carefully right wilhelm hitoff and then the important name one of the important name here what sir william crookes sir william crookes sir william crookes remember these bunch of scientists actually these scientists conducted the cathode ray experiment in order to check whether to check whether to check whether current electricity current electricity current electricity pass through the pass through the gaseous medium gaseous medium so that was the experiment right i told you that when we are discussing about the story of the electron remember they found the electron accidentally right actually their intention was to find out whether the current electricity passed through the gaseous medium right who are the scientists conducted this, this experiment j j thompson julius parker wilhelm hitoff and sir william crookes these are the people actually contributed for this experiment so this experiment known as cathode ray experiment right so their intention was again to check whether the current electricity passed through the gaseous medium remember sometimes you will be tested in the mcq paper sometimes you will be tested regarding these things very careful la huh? be very, very careful ah so what was the cathode ray experiment you should be able to describe what does mean by the cathode ray experiment so i'm going to draw the cathode ray tube can you remember the cathode ray tube that we drew hmm? uh, let's divide the cathode ray tube quickly in this way we can uh, have the a tube right heavy very strong glass tube so this is a glass tube right inside this uh, glass tube there are two metal plates so these are two metal plates remember these are two metal plates this is a negatively charged metal plate right since it is negatively charged metal plate this is known as cathode right and this is known as anode since it is positively charged one cathode and the anode cathode is negatively charged anode is positively charged right cathode and anode negatively charged one is cathode positively charged one is anode and then they have connected this cathode ray tube that means uh, two metal plates to a high voltage source they have connected this one to a high voltage source right so that is about 10 kilovolts only right so this is high voltage source high voltage source if it is connected to high voltage source they observe that from the cathode side to anode side some radiations are emitting right some of the radiations are emitting remember if we keep 
if we keep a fluorescent screen, remember fluorescent screen means actually a screen that is sensible for the radiations, right? So if the radiations are passing through some medium, if you keep the fluorescent screen, we can see the radiations, right? That means some kind of rays are emitting, right? So I showed you that uh, at the beginning, I showed you that uh, cathode ray experiment, some of the green color lights are emitting. Remember cathode rays are not green color. Remember cathode rays are not green color. Because of that fluorescent screen, we can see the cathode rays in green color, right? So therefore don't misunderstand from cathode side to anode side, they observed some radiation through the fluorescent screen. We could see that one in green color, right? Uh, listen to what I say here. What did I say you? They observed that from cathode to anode, some of the radiations are emitting. In the presence of a fluorescent screen, they observe these radiations in green color. So these are known as cathode rays. Remember, these are known as cathode rays. Why they have given a name like cathode rays? The reason is these cathode rays are emitting, these cathode rays are emitting from the cathode, right? We are going to learn about the anode rays also, but anode rays are actually positive rays, right? Positive rays are not uh, actually, we are not giving the name anode rays. Commonly the name that we are giving is positive rays, right? So positive rays are not emitting from the anode, but cathode rays are starting from the cathode. If you analyze the past papers, actually they have given some of the questions regarding these things also, right? Cathode rays are emitting from the cathode, right? And now, so this was an accident, I told you, right? This was an accident. They observed green color, they, they observed some radiations emitting from the cathode towards the anode side. And uh, JJ Thompson, right? Sometimes this tube is known as Crookes tube, in order to honor that Sir William Crookes. So he's the founder of the tube actually. So therefore, sometimes this is known as cathode ray tube. If not, we consider this one as Crookes tube, right? And I want to remind you that the pressure inside the glass tube was a one over 100 mercury millimeter pressure. So that was a very low pressure, okay? That was a very low pressure uh, that they have maintained, right? And they have supplied high voltage source. Since uh, we are, they are supplying high voltage source, remember inside the glass tube, the energy is very high. So therefore, they have reduced the pressure also. So they have maintained some conditions. Anyhow, they observe some radiations emitting from the cathode and they are moving towards the anode. These are known as cathode rays, right? So, uh, so now only J.J. Thompson, the scientist J.J. Thompson is coming to the plane. Actually, he observed this one. Actually, he re-observed these radiations and he conducted several experiments on the cathode rays, right? Can you remember the, what, are the, what are the experiments conducted by J.J. Thompson on the cathode rays. Can you remember them? So let's discuss quickly one by one. What are the experiments conducted by J.J. Thompson under the cathode rays, right? On cathode rays. So they were shocked, right? They didn't expect this kind of uh, radiations in this experiment. So therefore, J.J. Thompson re-observed these cathode rays, right? So when he observing these cathode rays, I'll take the summary of the experiments. Experiment carried out by J.J. Thompson. Right. And then let's go for the observation. Sorry. Yes, observation. And then uh, let's go for the conclusion. Right. Conclusion. I'm not going to discuss the diagrams here because uh, rather than dropping the diagrams, we can summarize what is the concept about that uh, experiment, right? So actually, there were three main experiments. Can you remember what was the main experiment conducted by uh, J.J. Thompson on cathode rays? The main experiment was J.J. Thompson kept an electric field, right? He kept an electric field in the path of the in the path of the cathode rays. Right, we know that uh, in the cathode ray tube, right, in this way, cathode cathode rays are emitting in this way, right. So uh, he kept two metal plates. This one is positively charged, and this is negatively charged. These cathode rays are deflected towards the positivity. So this was the experiment that we discussed. Okay? So the cathode rays are actually moving towards the positively charged plate. That means if they created the electric field. 
if they have created an electric field, these cathode rays are moving towards the positive tip of the electric field. If the cathode rays are moving towards the positive tip of the electric field means definitely we can observe, we can conclude that cathode rays are negatively charged. So that was the main conclusion. Ne? So therefore, let's write down the experiment. What was the experiment? Experiment. Uh, he created an electric field. Let's write down this one. Uh, kept an electric field. Uh, rather than writing kept, uh, we can write down created. Created an electric field. Electric field. In the path of cathode rays. Cathode rays. And what was the observation? Observation was cathode rays, cathode rays deflected or deviated towards the towards the positive tip, positive tip of the electric field. Positive tip of the electric field. Then we can understand what is the conclusion. Conclusion is cathode rays are negatively charged. Cathode rays are negatively charged. So this was the, the main experiment conducted by JJ Thompson. Right? He didn't know what are these radiations, right? So therefore, he reobserved these radiations and he conducted several experiments to identify the properties of these cathode rays. So this is the first one. Finally, he concluded from his first experiment, these cathode rays are negatively charged. If you go for the second one, can you remember in the second one, we drew a diagram like this. In this way, we have the cathode ray tube, right? In this way, we have the cathode ray tube and here we have cathode and here we have uh, anode. This is the cathode. So uh, JJ Thompson, he kept a metal cross kind of object, right? We can see that uh, simply that is an object. Right, metal cross. When he kept the metal cross in front of the cathode, he observed that uh, image of this metal cross. Here, he re-observed the image of the metal cross in this way. So this is the image, mirror image of image of the metal cross. So therefore, he concluded that cathode rays are travel in a straight line. Right? You can see the exact image, right? You can see the exact image of this metal cross of the opposite side of the glass pole. That means cathode rays are travel in a straight line and cathode rays have properties like light, right? They are traveling in a straight line and they have the properties like light. So therefore, he concluded that cathode rays are traveling in a straight line. So what is the experiment? Experiment was kept, an metal kept a metal cross, an object, okay? In front of the cathode, in front of the cathode. Then uh, he observed, what did he observe? He observed that uh, mirror of the cathode, that means uh, image, image of metal cross, metal cross at the opposite side, at the opposite side of the glass wall, right? Of the glass wall. So we can see that, right? So you can see that the, the conclusion was cathode rays travel in a straight line. Cathode rays travel in a straight line. Travel in a straight line. Like light. Like light. Right? So from this one also, we can conclude that actually. So this is another conclusion. Cathode rays have what? Wave nature, ne? Cathode rays have wave nature. Because we know that light, uh, light has wave nature. Number three, what was the third main experiment? Can you remember the paddle wheel? Paddle wheel. So uh, in front of the cathode, he created uh, a wheel, so a small wheel. We know, we consider that one as a paddle wheel. Right, some kind of a wheel like this, right? 
in this way and the cathode rays are colliding with this paddle wheel and this is started to rotate right so this is cathode and this is anode so this is starting started to rotate towards the anode right cathode rays are colliding with the paddle wheel and this paddle wheel started to rotate towards the anode right so that was the observation and the experiment what was the conclusion conclusion was conclusion was what thomson decided that cathode rays cathode rays have particle nature right they can do a work ne particulate yes particulate cathode rays are particulate they can do a work so that's what uh, they uh, jj thomson concluded right so therefore uh, third experiment third experiment was kept a paddle wheel paddle wheel in front of the in front of the cathode and uh, what was the observation what is the observation observation is paddle wheel started to rotate right paddle wheel started to rotate started to rotate rotate towards towards the anode the anode right the anode then what was the conclusion conclusion was cathode rays are particulate cathode rays are particulate particulate so from this one actually we can imply something very important using this one what is that one so can we say that what is the doubt can we say they have a force then yes right that means uh, they can do a work right they have an energy kinetic energy we can apply the kinetic energy equation half m is squared we can say that these particles have momentum because particulate means they have a mass right so therefore here we can see the duality nature of the electrons duality nature of the electrons later we are going to discuss about the duality nature de broglie's equation can you remember the de broglie's equation we are going to discuss this one okay right so these are the three experiments mainly experiment uh, three, main, three main experiments conducted on cathode rays by jj thomson right so addition to this one actually we can consider that cathode rays can ionize the gases right cathode rays can penetrate through a metal plate likewise there are some properties ne yes sinetma correct very good right so likewise uh, we can discuss some properties of the cathode rays right so finally they got a conclusion what is that conclusion cathode rays are none other than electrons neither right? finally they found the charge of the cathode rays right finally they found the charge of the cathode rays let's see look at this one right for the cathode rays we are giving another name so that is actually uh, beta radiations right cathode rays are nothing else but beta radiations we consider them as beta radiations right okay and then we have to discuss the charge and the mass of the cathode rays hmm? charge and mass remember uh thomson jj thomson calculated the jj thomson calculated the e over m ratio can you remember the e over m ratio value can you remember the e over m ratio value no need no need you don't have to write down these things okay this is kind of revision i told you so just listen and if you have any doubts let me know just listen listen right take your notes and revise everything so this is kind of a revision you don't have to write down okay in the theory class we have already written these things right so therefore no need so remember uh, e over m ratio value is 1.759 and the power 11 coulombs per kilogram so this is the e over m ratio for cathode rays who found this e over m ratio value who found this one j j thompson found the e over m ratio value remember students there was another scientist actually known as robert millikan right robert millikan he conducted an experiment that experiment was, uh, was known as oil drop experiment using the oil drop experiment he found that charge of cathode ray particles are 
right? So there was a scientist known as Robert Millikan. What is the name? Robert Millikan. Robert Millikan conducted an experiment. That experiment was known as oil drop experiment. We don't have to talk about this in our syllabus, but you have to remember the name, oil drop experiment. Using the oil drop experiment, he calculated the charge. Remember, E means charge. E means charge, right? M, what does it mean by M? M means mass, charge and mass, right? So he calculated the charge of cathode ray particles, charge of cathode ray particles. He found that one as 1.602 10 to the power minus 19 Coulomb. Coulomb is the unit that we are using to measure the charge of any electron, charge of any particle, any charge particle, we are using the Coulomb unit. So the charge of the cathode ray particles was uh, introduced as 1.602 10 to the power minus 19 Coulomb. Who found that one? Robert Millikan using the oil drop experiment. Then later they found that, actually uh, from the other hand, Michael Faraday and those scientists, they found that uh, the basic fundamental particle in electricity, right? Electrical energy is also what? That was also electron. So here they found the charge of the cathode ray particle. That also 1.602 to 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. So later they concluded that cathode rays, right? Cathode rays are none other than what? Cathode rays are none other than electrons. So this is the symbolization of electrons. Cathode rays are none other than electrons. So that was the conclusion, right? So look at this one. This summary is very important. Charge to mass ratio found by JJ Thompson, 1.759 coulombs per kilogram. And the charge of an electron or the cathode ray particle found by Robert Millikan using the oil drop experiment that is known as 1.602 to the power minus 19 coulomb. And cathode rays are known as finally electrons, nothing else, right? And cathode rays are known as beta radiations. How we can find out the mass of the cathode rays, right? How we can find out the mass of the cathode rays? Easy. If you know the E of M ratio value, remember, if you know the E of M ratio value, E of M ratio value, JJ Thompson uh, represented that one as 1.759, 10 to the power 11 coulombs per kilogram. Ne? And the charge, charge we know that 1.602, 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. So this is equation number one, and this is equation number two. From the equation number one and equation number two, you can substitute the charge of an electron to the equation number one, and you can find out the mass of an electron. What is the mass of an electron? Right? Can you remember what is the mass of an electron? 9.107, 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms. If you say this one in grams, that will be 10 to the power minus 28. So this is the mass of an electron. Understood? So this is the mass of an electron. We know the charge of an electron. We know the mass of an electron. Mass of an electron is 9.107 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms. In theories, we did the calculations regarding this one. So go through the note and everything and uh, recall these things, right? So now you can understand what are the main points you have to remember, okay? So today I'm going to discuss all the main points as a summary of what you have to remember, what you have to revise mainly under the first unit, okay? Right. So this is the mass of an electron, right? And uh, you should know that how to symbolize an electron. Very easy. Normally, uh, the symbol of an electron is symbol. Symbol of an electron uh, can be written as in this way: e minus one zero. Remember, students. This minus one is known as relative charge. Okay. This minus one is rel known as relative charge. And this zero is known as relative mass. This is known as what? Relative mass. Why this relative mass and relative charge? Normally, when we are writing the symbol, this is the way we are writing the symbol. We can't include the absolute mass and the absolute charge. What is the absolute charge of the electron? 1.602 to the power minus. 19 coulomb. What is the absolute mass? 9.107 to the power minus 31 kilogram. So we can't mention those things. So that is very complicated. If you 
write that write that one here that is very complicated so rather than telling the absolute mass and the absolute charge better we can write down relative charge and the relative mass right so remember when we consider the relative charge normally what are the three subatomic particles we are discussing under the topic electrons protons and neutrons right mm -hmm. so these are the three subatomic particles if you consider these three subatomic particles electrons are negatively charged protons are positively charged and the neutrons are neutral so therefore we have only two charged particles electrons and protons so therefore we can give the minus one for the electrons plus one for the protons right and if you consider relative mass remember students actually there is known as uh, what something known as uh, atomic mass unit atomic mass unit so what does mean by this atomic mass unit right atomic mass unit sometimes this is known as one one amu right if not we consider this one as one dalton right the value for this one is 1.661 10 to the power minus 27 kilograms so this is the atomic mass unit remember students atomic mass unit is represented in order to take the masses of very tiny particles like atoms molecules electrons protons neutrons very small mass they have a certain value that is known as one or else one u one a this is equal to 1.661 10 to the power minus 27 right can you understand these values we can use in this way. Now, why they have considered here? Can you all hear me properly now? Can you hear me? Breaking. Okay. If it is breaking again, tell me, okay? Let's see. Maybe some connection issues for me, right? Right. Now look at this one. Again. Okay, right. Now look at this. I've seen some little bit fast. Sometimes you will feel like that. Okay. Let's see. Uh, so atomic mass unit. So this is the atomic mass unit. Atomic mass unit is what? Represented in order to weigh the mass of particles in this way. Now we know that uh, the exact mass of the electron is 9.107 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms. So the exact mass, exact mass is this one, absolute mass. And this is the atomic mass unit. Comparative to atomic mass unit, you can see that mass of an electron is equal. Look at the mass will Mass of an electron is 9.107 10 to the power minus 31. So the mass of a atomic mass unit is represented as 1.661 10 to the power minus 27. So therefore, when you compare with the atomic mass unit, electron's mass is negligible. So that's why we consider the relative mass is zero. So likewise, we have a standard notation for the protons as well as neutrons, right? So this is this is the summary that we have to remember regarding the electrons, right? So we discussed about the cathode ray experiment, right? What are the experiments conducted by J.J. Thompson? And uh, we know that uh, what does mean by the E over M ratio value? Who found that? And we know what does mean by the uh, charge of an electron, the value 1.602, 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. Who found that one? Robert Millikan. And the uh, experiment was oil drop experiment. Later, they found that cathode rays are nothing else, electrons. Mass of an electron is 9.107, 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms. Symbol of an electron can be written in this way. So that is the summary. So always this summary should be in your mind. Remember students, atomic structure, the first one is very lengthy unit, right? And you will realize that one, after one year, two years, these things will be nothing for you. Now you just finish the first unit and you are going to the second unit. You will think that in the first unit, we have this much to remember, this much to memorize. No, it's not like that. Right? 
you have to always keep a summary in your mind right so this revision will be helpful for you to what are the things actually we have to remember as a summary we don't have to remember all the things right before go for the examination we should have a note proper note and we have to go through everything from the beginning but we can't remember everything neither always we should have a summary in our mind so that summary is very important right okay now uh, this is all about what electrons neither now let's go for the next subatomic particle what is the next subatomic particle the next subatomic particle was proton remember students uh if you go for the protons so the discovery of protons is also very interesting so this is all about electron then let's go for the protons so when we talk about the proton actually we have to uh, uh revise the name eugen goldstein right eugen goldstein so this name is very important okay this name is very important because eugen goldstein conducted experiment he conducted experiment using again the cathode ray experiment right he again uh, chose the cathode ray tube he took the cathode ray tube and uh, he observed in this way look at this one i'll uh, draw a diagram then you'll understand what was that so i'm not going to write down the high voltage source and everything so this is the diagram so this is positively charged anode and this is the negatively charged anode cathode and the anode right so uh, what did you do actually here negatively charged cathode and the positively charged anode so he uh, injected hydrogen gas here right he injected hydrogen gas here so when he injected hydrogen gas here hydrogen gas are actually what uh, colliding to the hydrogen atoms because we know that from the cathode side anyhow from the cathode side electrons are emitting from the cathode side electrons are emitting in this way so these are the electrons so these are the electrons emitting from the cathode side remember students now hydrogen molecules are injected to the cathode ray tube these electrons are colliding with the hydrogen molecules and this hydrogen hydrogen bond is breaking right hydrogen hydrogen bond is breaking breaking and furthermore this hydrogen atoms are ionizing these hydrogen atoms are ionizing by removing one electron okay hydrogen molecules are converting to the hydrogen atoms and then they are converting to the hydrogen ions cations so these are h plus cations Uh, now in the cathode ray tube we have h plus cation look at the experiment conducted by eugen goldstein na? now inside the cathode ray tube h plus cations are there so now in this h plus cations what happened this h plus cation started to move towards the cathode ah uh, then eugen goldstein observed that some of the radiation addition to the cathode rays addition to the cathode rays some of the energy radiations are moving towards the cathode so we can simply understand right we can simply understand if some of the particles are moving towards the cathode cathode is negatively charged so therefore definitely these particles should be positively charged and they found the protons right we know that the simplest gas the simplest element we can use is hydrogen simplest element is hydrogen so this is the simplest this is the simplest positive ray particle actually initially they gave a name eugen goldstein gave a name positive rays right so we are giving another name canal rays right so these are known as positive rays or canal rays right positive rays or canal rays these are known as positive rays or canal rays so later ernest rutherford gave the name as proton right so the mere, most simplest positive ray particle is obtained when hydrogen gas is used so that's why we consider that proton proton is nothing else remember proton is nothing else hydrogen nucleus 
hydrogen nucleus because we know that students if you consider the hydrogen atom in hydrogen atom there is only one electron and inside the atomic uh, nucleus there is a proton remember this is the one and only element without neutrons uh, in the periodic table this is the only element without neutron so therefore we can consider this is actually after removing this electron we can consider this is just a proton so therefore we can consider that proton is nothing else hydrogen nucleus neither are therefore these are known as positive rays or canal rays so this is the discovery of the positive rays actually they uh, how did how did they uh, gave the approach for the positive that means uh, how did they how did they thought may think about this remember atom is neutral atom is neutral they found the negatively charged particle if it is neutral remember negatively charged particle means uh, negatively charged particle is inside there definitely then positively charged particles should be there anyway. right if there is a negatively charged particle definitely positively charged particle should be there it's a must if it is a neutral one atom is a neutral one uh, that was the that was the motivation for the eugen goldstein to identify the positive ray particles or else we can consider protons right so that's the story of proton then uh, let's consider what is the charge and mass of the proton what is that if you consider the charge and the mass of a proton so let's uh, take a summary later about these uh, three subatomic particles right charge and mass of a proton remember students if you consider the charge of a proton charge of a proton this is also similar to the charge of an electron 1.60 to 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb remember okay as a chemistry students you should be able to remember these things these things are nothing and then if you consider the mass of a proton mass of a proton is equal to 1.67 to 10 to the power minus 27 kilograms right so this is the charge of a proton yeah if you have any doubts put your doubts in the chat box right right charge of a proton and mass of a proton so charge of a proton is 1.60 to 10 to the power minus 9 in coulomb charge of mass of a proton is 1.67 to 10 to the power minus 27 kg and then remember uh look at this one what is the symbol of a proton symbol how we can symbolize a proton proton is symbolizing in this way p11 p11 proton we know that i told you that this is the relative charge and this is the relative mass relative charge this is the relative charge and this is relative mass okay so relative charge is one relative mass is one what do you think about it? we consider that in an in an electron relative charge was so this is the relative charge this is relative charge and this is relative mass i told you that when you consider the electrons here we have written a uh, minus 1 now here for the protons we have to write down plus 1 because that is the charge of the proton right this is positive positive particles are considered as protons negative particles are known as electrons so therefore the relative mass is 1 we know that atomic mass unit 1 dalton is equal to 1.661 to the power minus 27 kilograms students compare these two values 1.67 to 1.661 to the power minus 27 up to the first decimal point up to the first decimal point two values are exactly same two values are exactly same up to the first decimal point so therefore we can consider that the relative mass of a proton is one right mass of a proton charge of a proton and the symbol of a proton right very easy very easy and remember uh, we can uh, consider that instead of this notation we can use hydrogen plus 11 is also possible and if you compare the mass of a proton and mass of an electron remember the mass ratio uh, we discussed this one in the theory also that is 1836 you can see that how tiny right how light 
the electron is okay look at this one mass of a proton and mass of an electron right okay now uh, let's move for the story of a neutron in the neutron actually we don't have uh, discussed that much here but anyway uh, let's discuss uh, some important things some important things uh, regarding the neutron <clears throat> right neutron remember students actually uh, the discovery of the neutron is very interesting because uh, if you consider uh, the mass of an atom the highest contribution for the mass of an atom is from the neutron not from the electron or uh, proton right so later let's compare the masses of these subatomic particles then you will uh, realize which one has the highest mass actually the highest mass belong to whom nothing else neutron right so the highest mass always belong to the neutron and remember the neutron is actually inside the nucleus right uh, now uh, they thought that right when they found the mass of an uh, atom they thought uh, they found that there should be another subatomic particle inside the atom not only the subatomic particles electrons and protons contributing for the mass there should be another subatomic particles that was known as neutron so neutron was found by james chadwick right so the neutron was found by james chadwick so uh, james chadwick conducted an experiment he sent alpha particles to beryllium pit and he found uh, a neutron neutral particle that is known as neutron so we can consider that whatever the uh, absolute charge or relative charge whatever it is so the charge is always zero what is the mass of a neutron mass of a neutron is always considered as what mass of a neutron 1.675 10 to the power minus 27 kilograms so this is the mass of a neutron right so you have to remember these things very very important now you can compare the mass of a mass of an electron proton and neutron right so then who you can find out who has the highest mass right and if you consider the symbol of neutron what are the symbol symbol of a neutron is actually we can consider that is n 0 1 you can see that this is the relative charge and this is the relative mass right relative mass and the relative charge relative mass and the relative charge okay there are some other particles in, except uh, neutrons and protons yes you can search that one right rather than uh, addition to these subatomic particles electrons and pro um, protons and neutrons inside the main nucleus there are other subatomic particles as well okay yeah mesons right there are some names okay right okay now remember <clears throat> i told you that there is only element in the periodic table uh, which does not contain neutron who is that you have to remember that one there is only element in the periodic table which does not contain neutron why is that hydrogen that's very very important okay right now uh, let's quickly summarize everything related to the subatomic particles quickly right let's revise it quickly
relative charge then uh, relative mass and then symbol if you consider electron what is the absolute charge 1.602 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb right what is the absolute mass 9.107 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms what is the relative charge minus 1 what is the relative mass zero what is the symbolization e minus 1 0 sometimes beta minus 1 0 then the next one the next subatomic particle is proton if you consider proton what is the charge same as electron 1.602 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb and what is the absolute mass 1.672 10 to the power minus 27 kilograms what is the relative charge plus one relative mass uh, we can consider one right and the symbol p11 if not hydrogen plus one one right and the third one third one is known as electron proton neutron neutron what is the absolute charge zero relative charge is also zero mass 1.675 10 to the power minus 27 kilograms and uh, you can see that relative mass is one so neutron is symbolized zero one You can understand when you compare the masses of the subatomic particle students, you can see that the highest mass belongs to the neutrons, right? That means mass of a neutron is greater than mass, uh, mass of a proton and uh, the least mass belongs to the electron, right? So the highest mass belongs to the neutron and the second highest one is proton and the least mass for the electron, okay? So these are very important. You have to remember. Absolute charge, relative charge, absolute mass, relative mass, these things are very, 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 right? So these are the three fundamental basic particles we learn under the topic. Okay, right? Always you should have the summary in your mind. That is very, very important. Right? Okay. <clears throat> then our next topic was uh, atomic models. Now we know that uh, there are three subatomic particles inside that term. After finding these subatomic particles, now uh, scientists uh, were eager to find out how these subatomic particles are existing inside an atom. So that's how the atomic models are created. So atomic models, a model for an atom right atomic models right can you remember what is the first ever atomic model that they have represented what are the first atomic model the first atomic model was dalton's golf ball model dalton's golf ball model what happened to this right at the beginning i told you that when you consider the dalton's golf ball model Actually, uh, after representing the uh, subatomic particles, that means uh, electrons, protons, and neutrons, is do do uh, what Dalton's golf ball model is actually ignored. That is wrong, right? And then second one was Thomson's plum pudding model. Yeah. Thomson's plum pudding model. Plum pudding model. Right? So, under the Thomson's plum pudding model that uh, he said that atom is look like a positively charged sphere. 
kind of a sphere like this, positively charged sphere. So inside this positively charged sphere, electrons are actually what? Deep like plums. That is look like the plums are deep in the pudding, right? So this is the model of the plum, uh, Thomson's atomic model. So you can see that how, uh, what wrong this is because uh, neutrons are not there. Where is the nucleus? So there are so many mistakes actually inside the Thomson's plum pudding, right? So the main uh, idea about the Thomson's plum pudding is actually we told that negatively charged particles and the positively charged particles exist, right? So atoms look like a positively charged sphere and electrons are deep everywhere in the uh, sphere like plums are deep in the pudding, right? So this actually we can see that this uh, concept is really wrong. Who proved this one? Who disproved this one? Who disproved the Thomson's model? The next scientist. What was the next model uh, that we need to discuss? Rutherford's. Uh, Rutherford's nuclear model. Right? Rutherford nuclear model. Or we can say that Rutherford's planetary model. Number four. Bohr's energy level model. Bohr's energy level model. And uh, then the last one, in modern science, we are accepting quantum model. If not, we can tell that electron cloud model. Electron cloud model, we are accepting that electrons are actually existing as a cloud around the atomic nucleus. So these are the actually three main, uh, five main types of the uh, atomic models. Dalton's golf model, we discussed that is actually wrong, disproven by Thomson and Thomson's plum body model, as I mentioned you, positively charged sphere and inside the positively charged sphere, negatively charged particles are deep everywhere like plums are deep in the pudding. And the Rutherford's nuclear model and the planetary model, let's discuss the experiment and the Bohr's energy level model, a somewhat uh, what, a successful model, right? And uh, nowadays we are accepting in the modern science electron cloud model. In order to build up this electron cloud model, uh, Erwin Schrodinger and Heisenberg, so those scientists are actually uh, contributed in order to create this electron cloud model, right? Okay, now uh, we discuss about the Dalton, Dal Dalton's golf ball model and the plum pudding model. Now let's go for the rather first nuclear model and let's discuss the experiment because that experiment is very important, right? Everything you have learned, okay? So we are going to revise them again. Either. Yes, yes, that's what I'm going to know. So rather first. Nuclear model. Remember, students, actually, for this one, Rutherford conducted an experiment. Rutherford conducted an experiment uh, with uh, his two students. So the first one is Geiger, and the next one is Master. Geiger and Master. Right? They were two students, actually. Uh, with the help of these two students, uh, Rutherford conducted an experiment. This uh, experiment is very famous. This experiment is known as actually gold foil experiment. Gold foil experiment, if not alpha particle scattering experiment. So the famous name is actually gold foil experiment, right? So if I draw the experimental setup for this one, so this is, uh, that is like this. Look at this one, you. So here we have kind of a solid lead container. Right.
right so this kind of experimental setup right so actually uh, these are some uh, beam of alpha particles right so this is actually a source of alpha particles right and this is solid lead container. Container. And this is zinc sulfide coated fluorescent screen. Zinc sulfide coated fluorescent screen. So fluorescent screens are using in order to see the radiations properly. So fluorescent screen. Okay. So this is actually thin gold foil. Remember. When they are conducting this experiment, remember alpha radiations. Alpha radiations are passing through this uh, gold foil, and uh, some of the radiations are nicely, right? So penetrating through the gold foil, and you can see the spotted. Here we can see that uh, radiation spots in this way. They are nicely passing through this gold foil, and you can see them. In this way, they are spotted like this, right? And some of the alpha radiations, some of the alpha radiations are deviated. They have changed their paths, and uh, in this way, you can see some spot in the fluorescent screen. In this way, right? Some of them are bouncing back in here, right? Here, some of them are not penetrating, they are directly bouncing back, right? Some of the particles are moving like this. Again, going with the uh, direction that they came, right? Look at this. Look at this. One. You can see three main obs observations in this experiment. Look at this one. The first experiment was actually alpha radiations are nicely passing through this gold foil without any deviation. So Rutherford and his two students actually implied that, had a conclusion that most of the space in an atom is empty. So that's why uh, these rays are alpha radiations are passing through the gold. And then they observed another two observations. If you consider 20,000 uh, 20, particles, one particle out of 20,000 particle, only one particle is deviating, changing the path that is penetrating, but changing the path, right? If you consider 100,000 of particles, that means one lakh of particles, alpha particles, one particle, that means very rarely one particle is deviating that means bouncing back. They are not penetrating through the gold foil, they are bouncing back. So they had a doubt why these particles are, some of the particles are penetrating through the gold foil without any hesitation. Some of the particles are penetrating, but they are changing their path, deviating, right? But some of the particles are bouncing back without any, but penetrating, those particles are not penetrating through the gold foil, they are directly bouncing back. So they found the reason for these things. The first reason is actually why these most of the particles are penetrating through the gold foil. The reason is the most of the space in the atom is empty, right? And uh, for other two observations, they uh, found the conclusion for that one also. The reason is actually atomic nucleus. Because we know that in the Rutherford's, this is Rutherford's nuclear model. So the previous atomic model was Thomson's model because in the Thomson's model, the, he didn't discuss anything regarding the nucleus, atomic nucleus. He didn't say anything about the nucleus, but Rutherford said that like this, okay? Uh, this diagram is okay, right? Try to get an idea, very simple, okay? Uh, one more thing I have to remind you that why we are using a solid lead container. Remember alpha radiations are very uh, harmful, right? So they have uh, ionizing power, the highest ionizing power. So therefore, alpha radiations are harmful. Uh, therefore, we are using solid lead container in order to prevent from the radiations because these experiments are conducted by humans, right? So these people actually humans like us. So therefore, uh, they 
followed some precautions. Uh, they used their solid lead container in order to prevent from the radiations, right? So try to understand. And alpha particles are known as what? Nothing else, helium nucleus. Helium 242 plus. Helium nucleus. So alpha particles are positively charged, right? Okay. Now I'm going to explain that uh, remaining two observations. Why some of the particles are deviating, penetrating and deviating, and some of the particles are bouncing back. Look at this one. Students, atomic nucleus is positively charged. Ne? Atomic nucleus is positively charged. Just imagine this is the one of the nucleus we have in nuclei we have inside the ball foil. If the alpha particles are, if the alpha radiations are coming towards this uh, particle in this way, look at this one. These are the alpha radiations. Uh, these radiations are moving through the gold foil without any issue. Ne? But now look at this one here. Some of the radiations are very close to the nucleus. So we know that alpha particles are positively charged. Since the alpha particles are positively charged, atomic nucleus also positively charged, and they are changing their path. That means some kind of a repulsion force. Repulsion force is created. Look at this one. When the alpha particles are getting closer to the nucleus, they are repelling. They are repelling. The repulsion force is created. Because when positive positive meet each other, what will happen? They will repel. Same charge. Now just imagine some of the particles are directly coming towards the positive particle. Oh my God. What will happen? So they are deviating with high speed. They are deviating with high, that means a very large angles. Some of them are directly bouncing back in this way. You go back again. Likewise. Because positive, positive, they, they do not meet, meet each other. Right? They will repel. And that is the reason, very rarely, some particles are deviating, penetrating and deviating. Some of the particles are bouncing back. So these particles are no issue because they are a little bit away from the, apart from the nucleus, they are nicely going through the gold. So Rutherford concluded that there is a small area there is a small positively charged area that is known as atomic nucleus. That is the most important, that is the most important thing that we have to discuss related to the Rutherford's nuclear bomb. That's why I told this one as Rutherford's nucleus. Right? He's the person actually who found the atomic nucleus, the existence of the atomic nucleus. Right? So there is a point mass confined area, positively charged one. So that is the atomic nucleus. Inside the atomic nucleus only, we have protons and neutrons, right? So that is the main contribution from the Rutherford's nuclear model. And Rutherford said that, like, uh, what? Uh, planets are orbiting the sun. What? Electrons are also orbiting the atomic nucleus. So that's why we consider this one as Rutherford's planetary model. Try to understand, right? And uh, the next thing is, he told that this atomic nucleus is very small though. Can you remember that football ground example, right? In theories also, I mentioned you that. If you uh, keep a beam at the middle of the football ground, that beam is what? Atomic nucleus. And the surrounding area in the football ground, ground is the area that electrons are existing. That means you can consider that is the size of atom. Now you can compare the size of the atom and the atomic nucleus. Right? The beam, the beam at the middle of the football ground, that is the atomic nucleus. And the remaining surrounding area of the football ground is what? Size of the atom. That means the area that is existing in the electrons. So you can compare the size of atomic nucleus and the atom. Very small. Right? Atomic nucleus is very small. So try to understand atomic nucleus is small area. Inside that small area, neutrons and protons are existing. Around the nucleus, electrons are existing. That's all. Right? That is all about the Rutherford's nuclear model. Done. Right.
what is the next model that we have to discuss? Yeah, Bose model, okay. Right, so the next model is a Bose model, Bose energy level model. Remember students, uh, remember when we go for the Bose energy level model, uh, Niels Bohr, there was a scientist known as Niels Bohr. So Niels Bohr said that, so this is the atomic nucleus. Around the atomic nucleus, there are some certain parts. Right, certain path that the electrons are existing in this way. These are some paths where electrons are existing. So these paths are known as orbits or else energy levels, right? Energy levels. Remember, these are hypothetical things, okay? N equal 1, N equal 2, N equal 3, N equal 4. So likewise, we have what? Energy levels. So these are the energy levels of the atom, right? So this is the main idea about the Niels Bohr energy level, right? So he told about the some kind of a location of an electron, right? Right. And uh, the most important thing that he said regarding the energy level model, if you take uh, what? If you cut in this way the energy levels and if you take an area in this way. So these are the energy levels. Normally, when we are going far away from the atomic nucleus, the gap between the energy levels are decreasing in this way. Okay. This is n equal 1, 2, and this is n equal 4 right likewise gap is decreasing so remember when one electron is moving for high energy level when one electron is moving for the high energy level it absorbs the energy right absorb the energy when an electron is moving from high energy level to low energy level so they emit the energy release the energy remember the abs they absorb or emit the energy as electromagnetic radiations, the energy of the electromagnetic radiations can be calculated using equal H nu equation, right? So remember, these are photons, right? These electromagnetic radiations are carrying the energy as photons, right? Energy of a photon. Energy of a photon is calculated by equal H nu Planck's constant multiplied by the what? Uh, frequency of the uh, corresponding electromagnetic radiations, right? We are going to discuss this one again. So try to understand this is main idea. When the electrons are moving for the high energy levels from the low energy level, they absorb the energy. When the electrons are moving from high energy level to low energy level, they emit the energy, right? Low to high, absorb the energy. High to low, they emit the energy. So try to understand. This is the main concept regarding the Niels Bohr model, right? And we know that how to uh, symbolize an atom, right? So when you are symbolizing the atom, uh, this is actually atomic number. And this is the mass number, right? We know about these things. You have learned these things in your all level time also. So this is atomic number. 
and uh, this is mass number. So atomic number is calculated by number of photons, right? And the mass number is calculated by number of neutrons plus photons. Very easy, right? So these are the three subatomic particles and the atomic models we have to remember. Uh, these are the basic theories that we have learned. Got it? Very, very important. Right. So the next topic that we discussed was isotopes. The next topic that we discussed was isotopes. So isotope means actually for the same element, for the same element, same number of uh, protons, right? Same number of protons. Uh, that means atomic number is same, but different mass numbers are there. For example, if you consider hydrogen, what are the isotopes of the hydrogen? We discuss these things, Nick. Isotope means same atomic number, same atomic number, but different mass numbers, but different mass numbers, right? So example, we can consider hydrogen isotopes. What are the three main types of hydrogen isotope? Protium, deuterium, tritium. Ne? Protium, deuterium, tritium, H11, protium, H12, deuterium, H13, tritium, right? Look at this one. Number of electrons, protons and neutrons. Number of electrons are same, 1, 1, 1. Number of protons, same, 1, 1, 1. But if you consider number of neutrons, 0, 1, 2, three. So we know that mass number is obtained by taking the summation of protons and neutrons. So here too, this is three. That's how we obtain the mass number of these isotopes, right? Same atomic number, different mass numbers are known as isotopes, right? And uh, we discussed there are two types of isotopes, stable isotopes, stable and unstable isotopes. Unstable means they are emitting some radiation, so therefore these are known as radio isotopes. Radio isotopes. Got it? Very important. Same number of protons, that is same atomic number, but different mass numbers. Those are known as <clears throat> what? Isotopes. And then we discuss about the relative abundance, about the isotopes, Rel relative abundance. Students, so what does mean by the relative abundance? Huh? Relative abundance. Relative abundance means the percentage value, the percentage value that exists in the nature, exists in the nature by the isotope, right? So that means we can consider that if you consider the three isotopes of hydrogen, how much of percentage value, right? What is the percentage value of protium in the atmosphere, right? We can consider, for example, this is 75%, right? This is 75%. This is 20%, uh, 20%. And this is 5%, right? So these are some uh, what uh, hypothetical values, okay? These are not correct values. So these are the relative abundance. Relative abundance means the percentage value that exists in the nature by that isotope. 75% of the hydrogen atoms, if you consider hydrogen sample, 75% is what? Protium. 20% is deuterium and 5% is tritium. So likewise, we can consider the relative abundance of the Isotope. Remember, students, using the relative abundance, we can say that whether this uh, isotope is what stable or not, right? Whether it is stable or not, right? The relative abundance value is high in protium. Ne? 
So therefore, we consider this is very stable. These are not that much stable. Who is the unstable? More. Who is the most unstable? Unstable isotope there, tritium, right? The stable isotope is protium. Unstable one is tritium. Got it? Very easy. Right, okay. Right. If you consider the isotopes, chemical properties are same. Chemical properties are similar, but physical properties are physical properties are different. Remember, if you do the past papers, actually you will meet this one. Physical properties are completely different because mass is changing for the chemical properties. The only affecting factor is electron, right? And the next thing is sometimes uh, you can find out the average relative atomic mass of an atom using the relative abundance and the, uh, the corresponding isotope, right? So we discuss some questions uh, regarding the isotopes. So let's uh, consider one question, right? Simple question. They have given that isotope and the relative abundance. And this is the relative abundance, right? And the isotope is uh, chlorine 1735. This is chlorine 1737. The relative abundance values are given as 75%, 25%. Then you can find out the average relative atomic mass, right? Average relative atomic mass of mass of fluorine. However, we know the isotope. Mass number is 35. You can multiply this uh, 35 mass number from the relative abundance value that is 75. Plus, if you consider the next isotope that is 37. 37 multiplied by 25 divided by total value 100. Right. So if you simplify this one, we can take that 25 as a common factor for this one. So this is 35 into 3 and this is 37. So this is 1 over 4. 35 into 3. 15, 105, 142. 142 divided by 4. So this is 271. 75 one means 35.5. When we are doing the calculations for the relative atomic mass, 
we are taking for the chlorine that is 35.5. If you know the relative abundance and the isotope mass number, you can find out the average relative atomic mass of that particular element. So these are the things actually we discuss about the isotopes. Very easy, right? Nothing. And we did some calculations in the theories. So you can practice those calculations again because those things are given in the tutorial. Okay. Right, okay. So uh, the next topic is location of electron. Uh, when we talk about the location of electron, actually, uh, uh, there are two things to remind you, but let's see. Location uh, of an electron. Before this, actually, we have to uh, discuss about the de Broglie's equation. De Broglie's equation. So, what is the De Broglie's equation? De Broglie's equation is lambda equal h over m v, where lambda is the wavelength, wavelength, and h is the Planck's constant. What is the Planck's constant value? Planck's constant value is six point six two six ten to the power minus thirty four joule seconds and then uh, simple m means mass and v is the velocity right so this de broglie's equation can apply for the electrons also remember the students de broglie's equation can be applied for the electrons also since we can apply the de broglie's equation for the electrons we consider that electrons are having the duality nature right Electrons have electrons have duality nature. What does mean by the duality nature? Duality nature means they can behave as particles, particles as well as waves. Wave nature and particle nature. We discussed this one. We discussed this one in the cathode ray experiment also. JJ Thompson already proved this one. Can you remember? When we keep that uh, metal cross, he observed the he observed the image of the, the metal cross. And if you keep the paddle wheel, paddle wheel started to rotate. So they are implying particle nature and the wave nature of the electrons. Right. So try to understand this is very, very important. Electrons are having both particle nature and wave nature. Remember, students. So this is B. Broglie's equation. Remember, lambda equal H over MV. Lambda means wavelength, right? H means Planck's constant, was well, 6.626 10 to the power minus 34 joule seconds. M means mass, V means velocity, right? Okay. Now, look at this one. In order to find out the location of electron, there are two methods in our syllabus that they have given. Uh, number one is spectrum analysis. Number one is spectrum analysis. Number two is ionization energy analysis. Ionization energy analysis. Under the spectrum analysis, we are going to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. First of all, we have to discuss about the electromagnetic radiation. Remember, spectrum means runs. What a set of electromagnetic radiations, right? Spectrum means electromagnetic radiation. Can I remember I told you that under the Niels Bohr uh, atomic model, so electrons are actually uh, gaining electrons and jumping for the high energy levels. And uh, those electrons are coming back to the low energy levels uh, while releasing the energy, right? So we can calculate that energy using the equation e equal H nu. Right, equal h nu. 
this is very important remember this is the energy of a photo e means energy of a photo energy of a photo right what is h h means planck's constant planck's constant the value is 6.626 10th power minus 34 joule seconds and new is the frequency frequency new that is greek letter and remember we have another equation we have learned this one in our o level time also what is that equation c equal new lambda right if i take this one as the second equation and this one is the first equation you can subject here new equal c over lambda and then substitute for the first equation then you are getting another equation e equal h c over lambda right so in the calculations we can use the equation right so this is energy of a photon right if you multiply this equation e equal h c over lambda from capital l if you multiply this one by capital l so this is considered as energy of a photon mole energy of a photon mole if you multiply this one by avogadro's number l means avogadro number this is avogadro constant avogadro's constant 6.200 10 to the power 23 per moles right so that is known as energy of a photon mole so try to understand uh under the electromagnetic spectrum electromagnetic spectrum is nothing else a set of electromagnetic radiations we can calculate the energy of electromagnetic radiation using this using this equation e equal h h mu okay right okay If you go for the electromagnetic spectrum uh, we discuss what is the electromagnetic spectrum 
we are starting from the we are starting from the radio and tv waves right radar waves okay microwaves infrared radiations right and then we have a visible light right so this is visible light and then we have a, what ultraviolet radiation and then we have x rays and gamma rays right so if you go for the visible light region so uh, we can have seven colors you know that what are the seven colors we have so we can uh, go one by one red orange yellow green blue indigo violet okay so these are the colors and we know that for this direction frequency frequency new increases wavelength lambda decreases wavelength lambda decreases okay this is the way so this is electromagnetic spectrum so spectrum means actually what kind of a set of electromagnetic variations right right okay so uh, we can find out the location of electron using the spectrum so when we talk about the spectrum uh, electromagnetic spectrum is very important so that's why i mentioned that one there now uh, look at this one uh, when you consider the spectrums there are two types Uh, the first one is continuous continuous and the second one is discontinuous continuous uh, for this one we are giving line or else we are giving another name discrete okay so for the continuous spectrum the nice example is what electromagnetic spectrum right that we discuss electromagnetic spectrum is a continuous spectrum Remember, students, continuous spectrum means actually all the energy radiations are included. Okay, in a particular wavelength range or frequency range, all the energy radiations are included, right? But in the discontinuous one, so only few radiations are included. So that's what we are going to analyze in order to find out the location of the electron. So the first discontinuous type is atomic absorption, atomic absorption spectrum. So the second type we are learning atomic emission spectrum, right? Atomic absorption spectrum and atomic emission spectrum. 
So these are the two types of discontinuous spectrum we have to discuss. So using the discontinuous spectrum only, we are going to find out the location of electrons, right? So there are two types of spectrums, continuous and discontinuous. Continuous example is electromagnetic spectrum. For the discontinuous, we have two types, atomic adsorption spectrum and the atomic emission spectrum, right? We can derive the atomic uh, adsorption spectrum using an experiment. We discussed that uh, experiment in the theories, but that experiment is not that much important, but idea is important. Atomic absorption spectrum. In atomic absorption spectrum, what happens is hydrogen atoms, we are taking hydrogen atoms as the reference atom. Hydrogen atoms are, right? Very easy. Look at this only. So this is one of the important topic, huh? hydrogen emission spectrum. Uh, let's uh, take a break after the discussion of the hydrogen emission spectrum. Okay, let's have a small break and uh, let's again. Stop. If not, uh, that's very difficult to neither concentrate. Right. Very easy. Just go through these things. Everything we have learned. So this will be nice revision for you to revise all your knowledge. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have the recording. Don't worry. I'll give you the recording. Don't worry. So uh, atomic absor absorption spectrum. Under the atomic absorption spectrum, actually hydrogen atom is absorbing the energy. Right. Look at this one. Really. Uh, here, in this way, there are some certain energy levels. So in this way, there are some certain energy levels. Right? This way. n equal 1, n equal 2, n equal 3, n equal 4, n equal 5. Remember, when the energy levels are far away from the nucleus, the gap is decreased. Absorption uh, spectrum is obtained when the electrons are moving from lower energy level to high energy level. Just imagine, electron is moving from the hydrogen's one first electron is moving from the first energy level to the fifth principal energy level. And then, the next electron, next electron means uh, the second uh, possibility, the electron is moving from the first principal energy level to the fourth one. And then another possibility, same electron can be moved from the third principal energy level and n equal one to two, right? Look at these tra transitions, right? n equal one to one to five, one to four, one to three and one to two. Right, these are the transitions n equal 1 to n equal 5, and this is n equal 1 to n equal 4, and this is n equal 1 to n equal 3, and this is n equal 1 to n equal 2. So, likewise, there are some electron transitions. So, remember, I told you that according to the Bohr's model, I told you that. When the electrons are moving from low energy level to high energy level, they are absorbing the energy because energy is very high. Since the energy is very high, they should absorb the energy. So therefore, we can have a line diagram. That line diagram, experimentally, we can observe that. Anna. Experimentally, we can observe that line diagram that is known as spectral line diagram. This is energy level diagram. Okay, This is energy level diagram. We can obtain the spectral line diagram for the electrons. Spectral line diagram. How is that? Spectral line diagram. So here we can see that uh, corresponding line for this one. 
in this way we know that okay highest energy belong to n equal 1 to 5 second highest energy belong to n equal 1 to 4 third highest energy belong to n equal 1 to 3 n equal 1 to 2 is the least energy so therefore we consider that energy and frequency energy and frequency increase for this direction and wavelength lambda decrease for this direction decreases okay for this direction energy and frequency increase and lambda wavelength is decreasing can you understand so this is known as atomic absorption spectrum energy level diagram and the spectral line diagram very easy so likewise when the electrons are coming back to again the ground level that means uh, principal energy level number one we can obtain the emission spectrum absorption spectrum means the spectral line diagram the energy diagram that we are having when the electrons are moving for the high energy levels when the electrons are coming back to the low energy level we are considering what emission spectrum atomic absorption spectrum and the emission spectrum right let's know the emission spectrum emission spectrum atomic emission spectrum emission spectrum look at this diagram Right, n equal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now look at this one. Electrons are moving from high energy levels to low energy levels. Electrons are moving from high energy levels to low energy levels in this way. Right, you can observe this kind of a energy level diagram right if i draw the spectral line diagram spectral line diagram is look like this here in this way here we have another line right so energy level diagram and this is the spectral line diagram Right? Look at this one. Electron transitions are from n equal 5 to n equal 1. n equal 4 to n equal 1. Electrons are coming back to the low energy levels. They are releasing the energy. Right? n equal 3 to n equal 1. n equal 2 to n equal 1. Right? Can you understand? So normally, these are considered as actually uh, bright lines bright lines in a dark background okay so in the previous one uh, i forgot to write down that is dark lines in the bright background because here actually they are releasing the energy emission the emission, emission spectrum means they are releasing energy so therefore these are bright lines if the energy are absorbed these are considered as what dark lines okay so this is the difference between the emission spectrum and the absorption spectrum, right? So why we are studying this spectrum? In order to find out the location. Location means these spectrum data values are giving us that energy levels, existence of the energy levels. Electrons are moving here and there between the energy levels. So these are some certain paths, right? That electrons can exist. 
electrons can move for the second principal energy level, third one, fourth one, right? So likewise, there are some certain energy levels. So actually the emission spectrum uh, analysis. So the next one we are going to discuss is hydrogen emission spectrum. So under there, we are going to learn that uh, hydrogen emission spectrum is proving the Bohr's theory, right? So that's the simple idea. Okay, right. Uh, I'll give you uh, 15 minutes, okay? A break, 15 minutes break. Uh, after the break, uh, let's again uh, start the session, uh, second session. Uh, let's finish the all the theories, uh, important theories that we need to discuss, okay? Okay, uh, quickly uh, have a break, 15 minutes, okay? After 15 minutes, I'll start the session.
Right, okay. Then uh, let's start again. So uh, look at this one. So we were talking about the emissions absorption spectrum and the emission spectrum. So the next topic is actually hydrogen emission spectrum. Right, hydrogen emission spectrum. This is very, very important. Emission spectrum. In recent past paper, they have given uh, first MCQ using the hydrogen emission spectrum, right? If you draw the energy level diagram of the hydrogen emission spectrum, first of all, right? So finally, we can see that uh, the Niels Bohr concept is correct because B Niels Bohr said that energy levels are exist. Electrons can move here and there between the energy levels. Ne? So that concept is proven by this emission spectrum. Let's see. These are some energy levels. Right, n equal one, n equal two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We know that, right? Look at this one. So, in the high emission spectrum, we can see some uh, several series, right? So, if you consider n equal seven to n equal one, it's look like this, right? Electron is moving from the seventh principal energy level to the first principal energy level. And here we can see electron is moving from the sixth principal energy level to the first principal energy level. And then five to one. And then four to one. Three to one. And two to one. Look at the electron transitions. Remember, these are electron transitions. All the electron transitions that are falling to the first principal energy level considered as Lyman series. This is Lyman series. Lyman series belong to the ultraviolet region in the electromagnetic spectrum. Right? Lyman series belongs to the ultraviolet region in the electromagnetic series. So therefore, we can't see that one, right? Ultraviolet radiations are not sensible for the our naked eyes. We can't see them. So therefore, these are the Lyman series. Look at the electron transitions, right? So you can see when you analyze the electron transitions, the highest energy belongs to the n equal 7 to n equal 1. Look at the gap. The highest gap belongs to n equal 7 and n equal 1. So therefore, the electron transition, right? So the highest energy released from the electron transition n equal 7 to n equal gap, n equal 1. So you, you can look at the gap and understand that. Now, all the electron transitions that are taking place, the first principal energy level is known as Lyman series. If you go over the Bama series, Bama series is look like this. So this is the Bama series. All the electron transitions that are taking place to the second principal energy level is considered as the Bama series. So this is Bama series. All right. So this is Bama. This is Bama series. Remember, the very first four spectral lines in the Bama series belong to the visible light. Right? Very first four. But here I'll write this one is related to the ultraviolet region. 
let's see okay what is the reason behind that now if you consider the bama series uh, very first four spectral lines first one is known as h alpha so this line is known as h alpha h alpha is red color we can see that so these are the only four radiations we can see in the hydrogen emission spectrum for our naked eye because bama series the very first four spectral lines are belong to the visible light region h alpha and then next one is h beta that is green color h beta green color second one and the third one is h gamma h gamma that is blue color right that is blue color and the fourth one is h delta that is violet color or purple color violet or purple color so we know that if you go for the electromagnetic spectrum that we discuss in the electromagnetic spectrum we know that a visible light region is starting from the red color and ending up with the violet color or purple color so therefore after the violet color we can't continue the visible light region so therefore we have to go for the next electromagnetic radiation type that is ultraviolet so therefore remember very important this one right very very important even though we typically generally we say that bama series belong to the visible light region but that's not completely correct students remember the reason is very first spectral very first four spectral lines are what related to the visible light region that is okay fine right you can see the colors red color green color blue color and violet color so after the violet color so there are many electron transitions right so not only these four there are many electron transitions that we can continue for the bama series so therefore those possible electron transitions are belong to the ultraviolet region the reason is h delta violet color is ending with the what uh, visible light region visible light region is ending with the violet color so these are belong to the ultraviolet region right so you have to keep that in your mind the next one the next series all the electron transitions that are falling to the third principal energy level so that is considered as partial series so this is partial right look at this one this is partial partial series belong to the ir region and then all the electron transitions that are possible for the fourth principal energy level right so these are what bracket this series is known as bracket so this is also belong to the ir region and then all the possible electron transitions for the fifth principal energy level this is fund fund series pfund fund that is also related to the ir region right lyman bama partial bracket and fund lyman all the electron transitions are to the first principal energy level bama all the electron transitions are belong to the third, second principal energy level partial third bracket fourth and fund fifth right so you can see the line energy level diagram look at the energy level diagram now when you analyze this diagram you can see that highest energy for the highest frequency we learned that equation e equal h nu right or we can say that e equal h c over lambda energy right energy corresponding these electron transitions are representing that electrons are falling to the lower principal energy levels of they are releasing the energy right they have released the energy so these electron transitions are representing that electrons are falling to the lower principal energy levels and they have released the energy so therefore these energies are directly proportional to the frequency and the inverse proportional to the wavelength so therefore we can say that which line has the highest frequency or highest energy which line has the highest frequency or highest energy highest energy belongs to the n equal 7 to n equal 1 and therefore we can say that for this direction for this direction energy and frequency both are increasing right so what happened to the wavelength wavelength is increasing for the other direction for this direction wavelength is increasing lambda increasing try to understand okay because the highest gap belongs to the n equal 7 and n equal 1 so try to understand this is lyman bama poisson bracket and fund 
hydrogen emission spectrum as a summary you have to keep this one in your mind always very very important got it very very important right so actually hydrogen emission spectrum is proving that Niels Bohr uh, concept is correct, nee? idea is correct because energy level concept is okay, fine, we can accept. Electrons are moving uh, between the energy levels, they are moving for the high energy levels to absorb the energy, coming back to the low energy levels by releasing the energy. So they are releasing the energy as electromagnetic radiations. We can calculate the energy of those electromagnetic radiations using E equal HC over lambda. Got it? So that's the way. Right? Easy. This is very easy. Some lines in the Bama series belong to the ultraviolet region. We know that. Can you remember in the electromagnetic spectrum, I told you that visible light region is ending up with the violet color, right? Red color, uh, orange color, yellow color, green color, blue color, indigo, violet. These are the seven colors in the visible light region. So the last line, that means the fourth line, is ended up with violet color, that means purple color. So can we continue here after visible light region? No. So therefore, the very next spectral line, very next electron transition in the Bama series belong to the ultraviolet region because after the electromagnetic series, after the visible light region, we have the ultraviolet region. Okay, very easy. Yeah. Uh, don't consider the gap between the series, but here I have keep some gaps between the lines in each series. This is to represent that energy level gap is decreasing. Look at this one here from here to here energy level gap is decreasing near the in order to represent that one. I have mentioned the spectral lines gap electron transition gap is also decreasing in order to represent that one. right nothing else in your resource book. They have given the spectral lines. But without considering these gaps, they have direct, they have given what? Same gap. So here I have mentioned this gap. The reason is I wanted you to understand that energy level gap is decreasing. Okay. So that's why I have mentioned that one in the electron transitions also. That's all. Right. Usual theory class start at 8, 8 p.m. to we are conducting that one to 11 p.m. So today I started this one in order to revise uh, these theories again. Okay, right. So don't worry about the time and everything. And so why you are worrying about the time? Hmm? I told you Saturday is for chemistry day. After 6 p.m., after 5 p.m., separate that time for the chemistry. Okay. So you are joining for joining for the online classes. So you can stay at home and nicely what? You can watch these things, right? And uh, thank God we have the class in Saturday. Sunday morning, uh, you are free, right? You don't have schools. Ne? If you have classes, normally classes are starting at 8, 9 again, right? So therefore, don't worry, right? Don't worry about the time. If I continue the class until 12, it doesn't matter for you, right? This is all about your involvement, right? If you don't have in your, your involvement for the subject, actually, you are not suitable to do the A-level examination, right? Look at this one. Now, uh, we drip the energy level diagram. Now, we are discussing the spectral line diagram. Right? Look at the spectral line diagram. Spectral line diagram is also same as the energy level diagram. Right in this way, we can uh, draw that one. So look at this one, Lyman.
This is Bama. Pasha. Bracket. And this is Pa. Right? Lyman, Vama, Pashan, Rakat, Okay. And uh, we know that this is H alpha. H alpha. H beta, H gamma, and this is H delta, right? So uh, we know that for this direction, energy and frequency, energy and frequency both are increasing, right? While lambda wavelength decreases. So this is the spectral line diagram. So try to understand this is the way. Okay. Hydrogen emission spectrum is proving that Niels Bohr theory is correct. Perfectly all right. Right. Okay. Now uh, let's go for the uh, ionization energy analysis. Uh, before we go for the ionization energy analysis, I want to uh, remind you that uh, there are two scientists actually known as Peter Zeeman and Johannes Stark. So these two scientists uh, conducted some experiments that uh, the spectral lines actually can be split again into the sub lines. Right. So actually the first name, the first name is actually Peter Zeeman, right? So Peter Zeeman tried that, Peter Zeeman, he sent these uh, spectral lines through the magnetic field, magnetic field. And then uh, he observed that these energy levels are again splitting into sub-energy levels. Here comes the sub-energy level concept sub energy levels right so this is known as actually zeeman effect zeeman effect zeeman effect right and likewise there was another scientist his name was johannes stark yes we have to write down the names properly right? johannes yes johannes stark Johannes Stark, he used an electric field. Using an electric field also, these energy levels are again splitting into sub-energy levels. Right? So that is known as what? Stark effect. Zeeman effect and Stark effect. Okay? So this is uh, about the what? Sub-energy level concept. Right? Energy levels can be split into Sub-energy levels. So we know uh, what are the sub-energy levels we have to discuss. SPDF, likewise, we have to discuss about the sub-energy levels, also, right? So try to understand this is also very important. This is all about the spectrum analysis. Spectrum analysis are proving actually uh, the energy levels are existing. These electrons are moving between the energy levels. They are moving to the high energy levels by absorbing the energy. They are coming back to the low energy level by releasing the energy, right? Okay. Right. Now let's go for the ionization energy analysis. Right. What does mean by the ionization energy? Right. Ionization uh, energy. 
What does it mean by the ionization energy? Ionization energy means simply we can say that is the atom, right? There are some certain energy levels. Just imagine this is the valence shell. In the valence shell, there is an electron. In order to remove an electron, we need to supply the energy. Because remember students, this electron is attracted towards the atomic nucleus from the nuclear attraction force. So ionizing means we have to remove this electron against the nuclear attraction force. That means we have to supply energy against the nuclear attraction force in order to remove this electron. That corresponding energy, that related energy is known as what? Ionization energy. For the ionization energy, there is a lengthy definition, but I will explain that one from an equation very easily. First of all, let's go for the first ionization energy. First ionization energy. First ionization energy is defined as, so this is I1. This is defined as, if I take a metal atom, M gas, <clears throat> we are removing one electron from this one to form M plus gaseous state cation. So it's remove one electron in this way. So this is first ionization energy. Look at the definition. Huh? Listen to me, right? Listen to me carefully. The minimum energy that is required to remove one mole of electrons, one mole of electrons from one mole of gaseous state neutral atom in order to form one mole of gaseous state single valence cation at the standard state temperature and pressure is known as the first ionization energy. I will repeat once. The minimum energy that is required to remove one mole of electrons from the gaseous state neutral atom in order to form one mole of gaseous state single valence cation at the standard state is known as first ionization energy. Why particularly gaseous state? We know that if you compare the states of matter from the gaseous state, we can easily remove the electrons because particles are randomly moving here and there. The gap between the particles are very low. Easily you can pick up an electron, right? Not unlike solids and uh, liquids, right? If you go for the second ionization energy, look at this one. Second ionization energy. Second ionization energy is known as I2 right i2 remember second ionization energy means we are removing one electron from that single valence cation not from the neutral atom right because some of the students are thinking that we are removing two electrons at once that is wrong that is completely wrong right second ionization energy means after removing one electron from this neutral atom it's forming single valence cation from that single valence cation we are removing another electron the definition for the second ionization energy is, right, look at this one. The minimum energy that is required to remove one mole of electrons from single valence mono, uh, single valence cation, gaseous state cation, in order to form bivalent or divalent gaseous state cation. At the standard state is known as the second ionization energy. Sir, so, then what about this one? If you are removing directly two electrons from the atom, then what it should be? If it is not the second ionization energy, what is that? So this is actually I1 plus I2 summation of the first ionization energy and the second ionization energy. Right? Try to understand. Okay? So this is all about the ionization energy concept. Now, ionization energy concept, how that is related to find out the location of electrons? Remember, uh, we can easily analyze the ionization energy graphs to find out the location of electrons. We know that students, now uh, we know the main location of electrons. What is the main location of electrons? Niels Bohr already said that the main location of electron is energy levels, right? And then uh, using the Zeeman effect and uh, what Stark effect, we found that. So they are telling that sub-energy levels are also existing, right? So now we can prove that sub-energy levels are existing by analyzing the ionization energy graph, right? So I'm going to draw the ionization energy graph for a particular element. I'll take a phosphorus. 
right? Then you will see that sub-energy levels are existing, right? Shall we go for the graph? We are going to analyze some ionization energy values and we are going to tell that uh, these are the exact location of electrons. That means we are moving further, we are moving a deeper uh, to find out the location of electrons. Sub-energy levels, energy levels, sub-energy levels, right? Later we are going to discuss about the orbitals. And then we are going to discuss uh, inside an orbital, there can be two electrons, maximum two electrons. Hund's rule, Pauli's exclusion principle, everything we are going to learn. Can you understand? Right? Uh, now look at this one. Easy. These things are nothing. Now you can see that we are going to analyze the ionization energy graph of phosphorus. How many uh, electrons are there in phosphorus? How many electrons are there? I will write down the configuration for the phosphorus. We are going to discuss the electron configuration also. Don't worry. But now uh, just remember this one. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. You know, right? We learn how to write down the electron configuration. 1s2, 2s2, 2, uh, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. When you uh, look at this electron configuration, these five electrons are belong to the third principal energy level. These eight electrons are belong to the second principal energy level, and these two electrons are belong to the first principal energy level. Right? So, therefore, if you are drawing the uh, atom in this way, so this is the atom. Right? There are two electrons in the first principal energy level. There are eight electrons in the second principal energy level. And there are three electrons in the third principal energy level. Right. Now look at this one. I n. So n equal 1 to 15. Okay. N equal 1 to 15 because there are 15 electrons. We are considering the consecutive ionization energies. I1, I2, I3, I4. Likewise, we are going to remove these 15 electrons one by one. Okay. We are going to remove the 15 electrons one by one. Let's see what will happen. So look at this one. Uh, there are three electrons. Right. right. Okay, we can draw the graph in this way. <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay. Here we have Three electrons. Right? So they are increasing, okay? You can see that INSA energy is increasing, okay? Little by little, it's increasing. They are not in the same horizontal place. And uh, then we are suddenly moving to the second principal energy level. That means this level. right and then these two a jump p 
here to here we have small jump right and then yeah right right okay this is the graph we can find out the ionization energy and uh, we can plot a graph in this way okay now look at the graph so this is i1 i2 i3 i4 i5 i6 7 8 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. All right. And this is 14 and I 15. Now look at this one space. Now you can see that one by one, we are removing electrons from the valence shell. We are starting from the valence shell, right? So we can easily remove the electrons from the valence shell because the nuclear attraction force felt by the valence electrons are low. So therefore, we can easily remove the electrons. Look at this one. We can easily remove these three electrons. One by one, we are removing. And one more thing you have to understand here. They have unique ionization energies, right? If you are removing this electron, even though that they are existing the same principal energy level, they have unique three separate ionization energies. I1, I2, I3. You can see here, in here we have slightly large gap. Okay. Slightly a uh, large gap okay and here also we can see that kind of a slightly large gap large gap but remember if you go for this one this is actually very large gap this is very large gap and here also we have a very large gap right Students, you have to understand that when you analyze in this graph, you can see that there are two very large gaps. Those are indicating that we are jumping to the next principal energy level. Here, in the last principal energy level, there should be five. Ne? In the last principal energy level, there are five electrons. After removing these five electrons, we have to go for the second principal energy level. Ne? So, therefore, the nuclear, the distance for the second principal energy level is very low. Third principal energy level and second principal energy. If you come to the second principal energy level, the distance is very low. So that means the nuclear attraction force felt by that those electrons are very high. So that's why their ionization energy is not very high. So you can understand by analyzing this graph, after removing these five electrons, these 10 electrons are belong to the second principal energy level. And again, you are obtaining same kind of a very large gap because after removing these eight electrons, we are moving for the first principal energy level. First principal energy level. Right? So therefore, we can understand that. We can understand that. So by looking at the very large gaps, we are moving for the principal energy level to principal energy level. Right? In equal one, there are two electrons. First principal energy level, right? You are moving from the second principal energy level to third one, you will obtain very large gap. Okay, already we know about that one. Principal energy levels are existing. We know about that one. Uh, we learned that one in the Bohr's diagram. And we proved that one. 
in the emission spectrum. Now that's not the case. Here you can see very large gaps. Sorry, uh, slightly large gap. What does it mean by this uh, slightly large gaps? Slightly large gaps are indicating that inside the principal energy level, we have sub energy levels. Can you understand? Remember, this is actually P3. Look at this one. 3P3. P sub energy level. P sub energy level in the third principal energy level. These two electrons are belong to another sub energy level that is S. These six electrons are belong to the P sub energy level. These two electrons are belong to the sub energy level. And here in the first principal energy level, we have only two electrons that is belong to the S sub energy level. So this slightly large energy gaps are indicating that inside the energy levels, sub energy levels are existing, right? So by analyzing the ionization energy graph, we can understand that each and every electron, after removing each and every electron, we can obtain unique 15 ionization energies for the phosphorus atom, right? Even though they are existing in the same principal energy level, look at the five ionization energy values. They are different from each other. Others are also same way, right? And the next thing is very large gaps are obtaining when you are moving from principal energy level to another principal energy level. Slightly large gaps are obtaining when you are moving from uh, what simple may sub energy level to another sub energy level. So ionization energy graph analysis of ionization energy graph is explaining that the existence of the sub energy level. Try to understand what I'm saying, right? So we should know what are the sub energy levels existing, right? So I will uh, draw a table, then you will understand what are the sub energy levels that existing, right? Look at this one. <clears throat> now we know about the energy levels. Let's go for the sub energy levels. Right. Principal uh, energy level. N. And then we can go for the sub energy levels. Right. Sub energy levels. Right. And then we can consider how the electrons are filled. How the electrons are filled. And then we can consider total number of electrons. Total number of electrons. Right. If you consider the first principal energy level, remember students, there is only one sub energy level, that is S. Okay. There is only one sub energy level, that is S. Right. Inside the sub energy level, there can be only two electrons. Maximum only there are two electrons. Right. If you go for the second principal energy level, there are two types of sub energy levels, S and P. So in the P sub energy level, there can be six electrons. If you go for the third principal energy level, there are three sub energy levels, SPD. Number of electrons that can exist in the D sub energy level is 10. For SPDF, 2, 6, 10, and 14. If you go for the fifth principal energy level, you can see that SPDFG, right? So there are 18 electrons in the J's of energy, right? So if you count the total number of electrons, you can see that 2, 8, 18, 32. And here we can see uh, 15, eh? 15. So the total number of electrons can be obtained in equation 2n squared. So 2n squared means, right? Substitute n value, 2 here. 2 into 2 squared, 8 here. 2 into 3 squared, 18. 2 into 4 squared, 32. 2 into 5 squared, 50. 
right? So this is a common equation to find out total number of electrons when you know the principal energy level. So this table is representing that how many sub energy levels are representing, how many sub energy levels are existing in a particular principal energy level, how the electrons are filled, and total number of electrons. You can see that the number of principal sub energy levels are equal to the principal energy level number. Right? If you go for the third principal energy level, how many sub energy levels are there? Three SPD. If you go for the fifth one, how many sub energy levels are there? SPD FG. Fine. Can you understand? This is the way. Right. So this is all about the sub energy level concept. That's all very easy. Principal energy levels. Now we can find out the sub energy levels also. Right. Inside an atom, sub energy levels are also exist. Very easy. Right, okay. Now let's go for the next concept. After finding the sub energy levels, uh, we can go deeper and uh, let's analyze orbitals, right? Energy levels, sub energy levels. Uh, the, the next concept is what? Orbitals, right? If you go for the orbitals, look at this one. Orbitals. What does it mean by orbital? Orbital means right the place where the place where higher probability higher probability of finding finding an electron right a place where higher probability of finding an electron right so that is known as orbital remember Orbitals are named as actually using the sub energy level name. Now, for example, if you consider S sub energy level, S sub energy level, or S sub shell, right? In the S sub energy level, there is only one orbital, right? Because we know that the maximum number of electrons in an orbital. Uh, the maximum number of electrons in the sub energy level is how much? Two, I told you. So therefore, so this is only one, one and only orbital in the sub energy level and there are two electrons. So this is the orbital in the S sub energy level, right? Normally orbitals are denoted in this way. And if you go for the P sub energy level, right? If you go for the P sub energy level, I told you that there are six electrons, right? There are six electrons. So how that these six electrons are existing? Remember students, there are three orbitals. Ah, right, electrons are filled in this way. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right, so how many orbitals are there? 
There are three orbitals, right? There are three orbitals. Three orbitals. If you go for the D sub energy level, D sub energy level, how many electrons are there? 10 electrons. There are 10 electrons. Then should tell me how many orbitals should be there. There should be five orbitals. One, two, three, four, five. Right? I'll tell you uh, there is a rule that how the electrons are filling to the orbitals. First of all, parallel spin electrons are filling, and then only opposite spin is going to fill. That is known as Hund's rule. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That means there are five orbitals. Right? So here you can see five orbitals are there in the D sub energy level. If you go for the F sub energy level, let's go for the F sub energy level also. If you go for the H sub energy level, you can see that how many electrons are there? 14 electrons are there. If there are 14 electrons, so you should know that how many orbitals are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is the way that how electrons are filling. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So likewise, we can go for the G sub energy level. There are 18 electrons. We can draw 9 orbitals. In the sub energy level, we have only one orbital. And inside orbital, there are two electrons. The maximum number of electrons that can exist inside an orbital is two. And remember, these two electrons are rotating to two different directions. If one is rotating to clockwise, other one is rotating to counterclockwise. This is known as Pauli's exclusion principle. In other terms, we can say that for two electrons in an orbital, they should have two different quantum numbers. Set, right? Since we didn't discuss the quantum number set, I'll uh, give you the simple definition for the Pauli's exclusion principle. Pauli's exclusion principle means there can be maximum two electrons inside an orbital. So these two electrons are rotating to two different directions. Their behaviors are two different, right? Okay. In a sub energy level, there is only one electron. P sub energy level, three electrons. D sub energy level, five electrons. F sub, S sub energy level, one orbital. P sub energy level, three orbitals. D sub energy level 5 orbitals, F sub energy levels 7 orbitals. And you should know how many electrons are existing in the each sub energy level. So this is the orbital concept. Very easy. How we can denote orbitals? When we are denoting orbitals, we are using a circle. So inside an orbital, there can be only two electrons. Okay. Right? So that is the way. Right. And addition to that one, actually, uh, we need to discuss the shape of the orbitals. So mainly we are taking SPD. If you go for the shape of S orbital space, remember shapes, right? S orbital is actually, a, they are telling that it's kind of a spherical shape, spherical. So this kind of a spherical shape, right? For the P orbital, actually, uh, they have given uh, what? Dumbbell shape. What is the shape of a p orbital? Dumbbell. Right? Dumbbell shape. Dumbbell shape means uh, it's kind of like this. Right? We draw that one in vertical way. This is the way. These are the shapes of p orbitals. Dumbbell. Right? And uh, <coughs> I want to remind you that. Uh, for the D sub energy level, we have different shapes, uh, some kind of a donut shape, donut and dumbbell both are there. So you can search that one, okay? So uh, if you go for the P orbitals, P sub energy level, inside the P sub energy level, there are three P orbitals. Uh, there are six electrons. So these six electrons can be located inside three B orbitals. Actually, there are three orbitals. Actually, these three orbitals are existing in this way. So this is very important. Na? If we consider the plane X, Y, Z, and this is C, so these are three planes X, Y, Z, right? <clears throat> so in the X plane, So this is Px orbital. Look at this one. The orbital exists in the x-plane is Px. And the orbital 
exist in the y this is y ne right in the y axis this is known as py right and the orbital existing in the z plane that is known as pz right can you see that there are three types px orbital py orbital and pz orbital right so if you draw that one if you draw that one in the same diagram it's look like this right y x and z here the px orbital and here we have px orbital px orbital py orbital and this is pz orbital All right look at this one px py pz right that's the way so they are in three different planes try to understand very easy This is not in our syllabus, but remember, if I told you that there are five d orbitals, there are five d orbitals. So the types of these orbitals actually are d x y, d y z, d x z, d z squared, and the last one is a uh, d x squared y squared. So you don't have to remember this one for your knowledge. You can remember these are the five D orbitals. Go to the Google and search for you. Uh, what are the shapes of D orbitals? Then you can see the shapes. Okay. So those things are not related to our syllabus. Those are therefore we don't have to go that much deep, right? Right. So this is uh, the theories related to the orbitals, right? Very easy. These things are not that much difficult. Okay, very easy. Right. So I'll explain you here the Pauli's exclusion principle also. Pauli's exclusion principle. Principle. Remember, Pauli says that uh, there can be maximum maximum two electrons in an orbital. And they have opposite spin, opposite spin. In other terms, we can tell that they have two different quantum numbers. quantum number set
okay so our next topic is electron configuration very important right so remember pauli's expression principle says that there can be maximum two electrons in an orbital and they have opposite spin they have two different quantum number sets right okay now our next topic is electron configuration so what does mean by the electron configuration so electron configuration means what easy you have learned the electron configuration in your all your time but that's not the correct one so here actually uh, now we have learned energy levels sub energy levels orbitals using them only we are going to find out the electron configuration remember electron configuration is used to define the exact location of electrons or else we can define the uh, electrons the electron system inside an atom using the uh, electron configuration right so therefore this is very important let's see uh now look at this one if you ask to write down the electron configuration for sodium like element let's see level so normally this is the way you are writing the electron configuration okay very easy uh we know that let's go for the first principal energy level so therefore i will write down here first what is the sub energy level that existing in the first principal energy level only s in the first principal energy level s sub energy level how many electrons are there two are there for configuration can be written as one is two right and then so the second, first principal energy level is done because there can be maximum two electrons if you go for the second principal energy level there are two sub energy levels those two sub energy levels are 2s and 2p there are only two ne s and p in the s sub energy level there can be two electrons in the p sub energy level there can be six electrons. right <clears throat> now if you go for the third principal energy level starting in s in the sub energy level, there can be maximum two electrons <clears throat> but remember students sodium's atomic number is 11 we can stop here here one 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s1 this is the configuration of sodium inside the first principal energy level there is a s sub energy level there can be two electrons inside the second principal energy level there is a there is a sub energy level as well as p sub energy level inside this sub energy level there are two electrons inside the p sub energy level there are six electrons and there is only one remaining electron that is going for the third principal energy level s sub energy level so that's all if you know the energy level concept sub energy level concept and the orbital these things are nothing for you right these things are nothing uh, let's go for silicon right as an example silicon 14 what should be the configuration 1s2 done with the first principal energy level 2s2 2p6 right second principal energy level done now 3s2 are uh, third principal energy level s sub energy level also done because here 40 electrons are there 2 4 10 12 and then the remaining electrons are 2p2 the maximum number of electrons we can go for here is what 2p6 right 2p6 try to understand <clears throat> let's go for nitrogen 7 1s2 2s2 right 2p3 ah 2p3 this is nitrogen first principal energy level s sub energy level two electrons first principal energy level s sub second principal energy level s sub energy level two electrons and p3 we can go for neon 1s2 2s2 2p6 right aluminum 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p1 3p1 argon 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p6 here is the argon potassium 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p6 3d1 is this correct is this correct 
what is the potassium configuration is this correct no this is wrong this is wrong right if i if i write down the calcium configuration 20 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p6 3d2 is that correct is that correct no these both configurations are potassium and calcium both are raw why is that so this is correct ne? after p sub energy level since we are in the third principal energy level we have to go for the d sub energy level there can be d sub energy level yes auf bau here is the first theory we are going to learn under the electron configuration i am going to explain you why these configurations are the potassium's exact configuration is 3p6 4s1 and calcium is 4s2 so how is that possible after 3p that should be 3d right i think you have made a mistake sir no 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 actually yeah, this should be the correct configuration this is correct this is correct i'm going to explain you aufbau principle remember students electron configuration means how the electrons are filled to the energy level in order energy level order but remember when we are learning the electron configuration we have to learn many things many things right so the first thing i'm going to teach you here is aufbau principle right the first thing i'm going to teach you here aufbau principle Look at the Aufbau principle. Aufbau is a German term, right? Aufbau meaning that building up, building up something. That's what meant by the Aufbau, building up something, Aufbau. Now, we are expecting that when we are writing the electron configuration, the electron should be filling to the correct order of the energy levels. What should be the correct order? Oneness. 2s 2p 3s 3p 3d 4s 4p 4d 4f so this is the expected order of filling electrons isn't it when we are writing down the electron configuration this is the order that you expected but remember students this is not correct this is not the correct order right according to the aufbau principle we can say, right, look at the order 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f, 5g. Okay. And here I'll write down 6s, 6p. Uh, 6d 6f so that is enough right now look at this one listen to this very carefully Right, one s, two s, okay, two p. 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, 6s, 5d, 6p. Look at the pattern. What is that pattern? The pattern is, right, the pattern is 1s, 2s, 2p. Okay, that is okay. And then 3s, 3p. 
after 3p we are expecting that it should be 3d but the order is 4s and then 3d 4p 5s 4d 5p 6s look at the order look at the order right so this is not the expected way right aufbau principle says that this is the way practically this is the way that electrons are filling to the energy levels for downward energy is increasing energy increases right aufbau principle says that how the electrons are going to filling to the sub energy levels practically right practically this is the way that electrons are filling to the sub energy levels remember the order 1s 2s look at this one 1s 2s 2p 3s 3p 4s 3d 4p 5s 4d 5p 6s that should be the order right this is the electron filling order electron filling order electron filling order for the elements right this is not the electron configuration so then how we can write down the electron configuration now shall we take that potassium and calcium one potassium was 19 right potassium was 19 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p6 right after 3p according to the filling order what it should be 4s not 3d therefore we had to write down 4s1 calcium which is 20 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p6 4s2 this should be the configuration so how is that happen so that is happen because of the energy i'm going to draw the energy diagram then you will understand look at this one n equal 1, n equal 2, n equal 3, n equal 4, and n equal 5. Right? So, these are the sub-energy levels. In the first principal energy level, we have only 1s. If you go for the second principal energy level, we have 2s and 2p. Right? So, this axis is energy. Right? This axis is energy. And here, this one is considered as 3s, 3p, 3d. That means 3s, 3p, and this is 3d. Look at this one. If you go for the 4d, 4d come down after 3d. Ah, look at this one. Right Energy of the 4s orbital is lesser than the energy of 3d. That's why 4s electrons are filling. Electrons are filling to the 4s orbital, 4s sub energy level before 3d. That is the reason. And here we can say that after 4s, 3d, and then 5, 4p. Right? After 4p, before it go for the 4d, it comes to the 5s. Here, look at this. This is 5s. And then only it is going for the Right, so this is some kind of a weird pattern eh? because we know that these sub energy levels are mixing. Okay? Right, when the energy increases, we know that energy level gap is decreasing. When the energy level gap is decreasing, these orbitals can mix, that means gap is reduced. Gap is reduced, so therefore, these electrons can jump here and there easily because energy gap is very low. Look at this one an electron can't jump easily from the first principal energy load to the second principal because gap is very high 
But if you go for the fourth one, fifth one, sixth one, likewise, consecutive I mean, energy levels, these electrons can be shifted here and there. So therefore, try to understand th this is the reason why we have this kind of a variation. Aufbauer principle explains that how the electrons are filling to the energy levels, sub-energy levels. Right? So this is the energy diagram of these sub-energy levels. Try to understand. Okay? Very, very important. Right. So that is very uh, important theory under the electron configuration. Right. Now look at the next theory part. Hoon's rule. So what does it mean by the Hoon's rule? Remember, Hoon's rule means, Hoon's rule says that when the electrons are filling to the orbital, they are following that uh, electrons are filling to the orbitals one by one. Just uh, imagine P sub energy level. Let's go for the P sub energy level. If you go for the P sub energy level, there are three P orbitals in this way. Ne? Electrons are filling to the P sub energy level one by one. Ne? So that's what Hun's rule says that. So the first electron is filling to the first orbital with the same direction. And the second electron also filling to the orbital with the same direction. Third electron is also filling to the orbital in the same direction. And this is fourth one. Uh, now look at this one. Look at the fourth electron. The fourth electron is going for the again first orbital and this is opposite in the direction. And if you go for the fifth electron, opposite in direction. Uh, now this is in this way. Remember this is P1, P2 configuration. P3 configuration, P4 configuration, P5 configuration, and P6. Remember, students, P3 configuration is considered as stable configuration, and P6 is also considered as a P stable configuration. Why? What is the reason? The reason is look at this one the symmetrical order arrangement, the symmetrical arrangement of the electrons. Because of the symmetrical arrangement of this electron, we consider this configuration, P3 configuration, is to be stable. As well as P6, all the orbitals are completely filled. Right? So therefore, these configurations are. So this configuration is very much stable than this P3. Right? So try to understand. Hoon's rule says that when the electrons are filling to the orbitals, electrons are filling one by one with the same direction. And then only opposite direction electrons are filling. And the next thing you have to remember here, apart from the Hoon's rule, we can say that 
If you analyze these configurations, P3 and P6 configurations are stable because of the symmetrical arrangement. Among them, P6 is the most stable one, right? If you go for the D sub energy level, D sub energy level, there are five D oblivious. In this way. One by one, whose rule? One by one, me same direction. Ah, right. D one configuration, D two configuration, D three, D four, and D five. You can see that D five configuration is stable. Then D six, D seven, D eight. D9, and this is D10. D10 configuration is the most stable one among the others, right? D5 and DT configura configuration are stable, as well as P3 and P6 also, those are also stable, right? Try to understand, okay? This is very important. Now look at this one. Let's write down some uh, configuration for elements. Scanadium 21. Electron filling order according to the Aufbau principle. Electron filling order that is 1s2, 2s2. 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d1. This is the electron filling order according to the off principle. But remember students, this is not the configuration. Electron configuration means we have to rearrange that one according to the energy level order. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3D1, 4S2. Ah, this is the electron configuration. Try to understand the difference between electron configuration and the electron filling order. As the next element, I'll consider chromium. Electron filling order. Electron filling order is 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2. 3p6, 4s2, 3d4, yes. And the electron configuration is very important. Why? What is the reason? The reason is actually, you can see that, now look at the electron configuration. This is very important. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d5, 4s1. Why 3D5 and 4S1? Remember students, here this is the S sub energy level and here we have D5 orbitals. In order to <coughs> gain the greater stability, one electron will be shifted to the D sub energy level in the chromium atom. And then the configuration is becoming 4S1 and 3D5. 4S1 and 3D5 stable, therefore the configuration of chromium is 3D5, 4S1. It's rearranging. Chromium's configuration is rearranging. In the 3D elements, in the periodic table, we are considering chromium and copper are the elements that rearrange in their electron configuration. Right? As the third example, let's go for the manganese. Manganese is uh, 25. 
इलेक्ट्रॉन फिलिंग मोड टू पी सिक्स थ्री एस टू थ्री पी सिक्स फोर एस टू थ्री डी फाइव राइट सो दिस वन इलेक्ट्रॉन कन्फिग्रेशन इज थ्री डी फाइव फोर एस टू इजी एज द फोर्थ एग्जाम्पल लेट्स गो फॉर द कोपर Uh, this is four s two three d nine. Again, this configuration is rearranging. Why? Because we know that four s two three d nine. It's uh, it should be like this. Four s two three d nine is look like this. So we can rearrange this electron configuration to four s one and three d ten by giving one electron there. So therefore, the configuration is becoming stable. By rearranging the configuration, three D ten points. Number five, zinc. Zinc is thirty. Electron filling order four S two three D ten, and this is three D ten four S two. Very easy. So this is the electron filling order and the electron configuration. Try to understand.
now okay right? sorry mic is muted right? right okay so our next topic is quantum numbers can you hear me properly done so there are four types of quantum numbers n l m l m s remember simple n means principal quantum number principal quantum number principal quantum number is representing the principal energy level principal energy level so that is known as the principal quantum number simple l this is known as angular momentum angular momentum o azimuthal azimuthal quantum number so this is representing actually the sub energy level so this is like our address right house number street number village and city right so likewise here only energy level sub energy level ml ml means magnetic quantum number magnetic quantum number is representing what number is representing the uh, orbital type orbital type right and the last one is spin quantum number spin quantum number right spin quantum number is representing the uh, rotation of the electron if not what is the electron there are two types ne? rotation of the electron right so there are four types of quantum numbers nl ml ms principal quantum number which is representing the principal energy level angular momentum quantum number which is representing the sum energy level magnetic quantum number representing the orbital type spin quantum number which is representing the rotation of electron right so that's really easy Uh, now, if we go for the principal quantum number n, remember students, principal quantum number n. So, the principal quantum numbers, we can assign the values n equal 1, 2, 3, 4. Likewise, we can go for the until n energy level. So, the values that we are assigning for the uh, principal quantum number is 1, 2, 3, 4, like this. So the next one is azimuthal quantum number, which is represented the sub energy level. For the sub energy levels, we are giving uh, quantum numbers like this: sub energy level, sub energy level, and here we can consider the quantum number azimuthal quantum number, right? S, P, D, F. For the S, we are assigning zero. P one, D two, and F is three. So these are the quantum numbers we are assigning for the sub energy levels. For the sub energy level 0, P sub energy level 1, D sub energy level is 2, F sub energy level is 3. I'll explain to you, right? When we are discussing the examples, I'll explain. To you. If you go for the uh, what? Magnetic quantum number, this is really interesting, right? The reason is if you go for the S sub energy level, there is only one orbital. For that orbital, we are giving there are two electrons quantum number zero uh, that is what magnetic quantum number if you go for the p sub energy level there are three p orbitals for them we are giving quantum numbers minus one zero plus one right if you go for the d sub energy level there are five d orbitals look at the uh, magnetic quantum number 0 middle one this one minus 1 minus 2 this is plus 1 plus 2 right if you go for the f 
there are seven orbitals ne 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 for well, this one mark 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 and here minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 right so these are the magnetic quantum numbers we can assign right and the last one is spin quantum numbers spin quantum number is really serious if there are two electrons in an orbital we can assign plus half for this electron and minus half for this one. that means if one is rotating to clockwise other one is counter clockwise if this is counter clockwise this is clockwise so this is the summary of the quantum numbers very easy very easy okay <clears throat> look at the magnetic quantum number most of the students are confusing with this magnetic quantum number. that is very easy magnetic quantum number is orbital type if you go for the s sub energy level we have only one s orbital so there was zero if you go for the p sub energy level there are three orbital types minus 1 0 plus 1 if you go for the d sub energy level five d orbital types minus 2 minus 1 0 plus 1 plus 2 if you go for the f minus 3 minus 2 minus 1 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 energy level sub energy level orbital type and the spin plus half or minus half. right that's very easy right let's consider an example i'm going to consider neon and i'm going to write down a uh, quantum number set for the all electrons in neon remember neon is 1s2 2s2 2p6 this is the configuration we know that if you go for the first principal energy level there is an orbital there are two electrons if you go for the second principal energy level here we have s orbital two electrons and here we have three p orbitals and there are six electrons right now we have to write down the what quantum number set for there are 10 electrons there right now let's choose this electron okay so we can write down con uh, quantum number set for this one right one first principal energy level s sub energy level zero right s orbital zero let me consider this is plus half here the quantum number set so quantum number set is kind of a identification number for particular element quantum number set for an element is unique remember so the other electron right other electrons so i'll give you the numbers for this one 1 2 and okay, this is number 1 this is number 2 1 zero 0 minus half right s sub s principal uh, may first principal energy level s sub energy level s orbital plus half or minus half we are done with these two electrons right now let's go for this one let me consider this is third one and this is fourth one right third electron that is belong to the second principal energy level 
S sub n is equal. Therefore, 0. S orbital 0 plus half. Other one is minus half. Very easy. Right? Very easy. Okay. Let me consider this electron is the fifth one. This electron is the sixth one. And this is the seventh one. Right? Five, six, seven. <coughs> Five. Second principle energy level, P sub energy level. Therefore, one. Right? Which orbital is this? We can assign this is minus one, this is zero plus one. Uh, therefore, minus one. Uh, let's consider this is plus half. Then the sixth one, second principle energy level, right? P sub energy level, zero orbital plus half. Seventh electron, second principle energy level, P sub energy level, plus one orbital and the plus half. Right? And let me consider this is eighth electron, this is ninth one, and this is tenth one. Eight, nine, ten. Right? Two second principle energy level, P sub energy level, minus one, minus half. Second principle energy level, P sub energy level, zeroth orbital minus half. Plus one minus half. Look at the way. Each and every electron has a unique quantum number set. That's all. This is the concept. If you can understand the concept, you can do any kind of a question. Very easy. I don't know to get it up. Okay, right. Uh, we have remaining uh, only one part classification of elements and the periodic uh, trends, that means atomic properties. Uh, let's have another break, okay? 10 minutes break, and let's uh, discuss the remaining session. Uh, third session, the last session, uh, after the break, okay? Take a break quickly.
Right, okay. Shall I start the remaining uh, parts? Now uh, we can uh, discuss about the periodic table. I'm not going to draw the periodic table, right? So let's analyze the periodic table, right? In the periodic table, actually, uh, what are the things we have remember, right? In the periodic table. The first thing you have to remember, there are 18 elements. Uh, first of all, uh, who built the periodic table? Can you remember? We learned that. Some uh, names are there to remember. Dimitri Mendeleev, Lothar Mayer. So those are the famous names. So I'll write down the names that are very important. Right? Johann Wolfgang. Right. <coughs> and then uh, we can uh, John Newlands. Right. Lotha Mayer. And uh, Dimitri Mendel. Okay. <laughs> so we consider that the current periodic table is uh, developed by Dimitri Mendel. And remember, there are 118 elements in the periodic table. And the periodic table is classified blockwise. Right? Actually, there are four blocks in the periodic table. S block, P block, T and F blocks. These are the blocks in the periodic table. Especially, I want to uh, mention you about uh, here F block. F block is actually categorized as two series in the periodic table. First one is lanthanide series. And the next one is actinide series. Lanthanum series and the actinide series. Right? Try to understand. And if you analyze uh, further the periodic table, how many periods and how many groups are there? Can I remember that we discussed? In the periodic table, there are seven periods. Right? There are seven periods. And there are 18 groups in the periodic table. Seven periods and 18 groups in the periodic table. Right? And then, Remember, so period means actually rows in the periodic table. Group means columns in the periodic table. Seven periods and 18 groups in the periodic table, right? And uh, then what else we have to discuss on the periodic table? We know that <clears throat> there are 11 gases in the periodic table. Can we name them element-wise? Hydrogen. Helium, right? Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, right? Chlorine, argon, krypton, xenon, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So these are the eleven gases in the periodic table. And remember, in the, in the periodic table, there are two liquids, right? In the standard state, there are two liquids. First one is bromine and the next one is mercury. Bromine and mercury are the two uh, liquids in the periodic table that we can consider. Right? Try to understand these things are 
very very important <coughs> right very important okay and uh, then we can classify the elements in the periodic table right elements in the periodic table that uh, metals and non metals most of the periodic table elements are metals that means if you consider uh, right 80% right approximately 80% of the periodic table are metals so the remaining are non metals okay 80% are metals if you consider the metalloids what does mean by the metalloids metalloids means the elements which are having metal and non metal properties right so what are the metalloids in the periodic table right so the metalloids are boron silicon germanium arsenic antimony tellurium astatine and polonium so these are the metalloids <clears throat> metalloids means elements which are having both metal and non metallic properties right both non metallic properties metals and non metallic properties and then uh, amphoteric elements what does it mean by amphoteric elements amphoteric elements means elements uh, which are which can react with acids and bases both beryllium right then uh, aluminium <coughs> tin lead and zinc so these are the five amphoteric elements in the periodic table right these are the five amphoteric elements in the periodic table you heard correct right this is very important you have to remember these things under the periodic elements okay periodic table this is not all about drawing the periodic table or memorizing the periodic table you have to analyze the periodic table <clears throat> right okay ne? right <clears throat> right so these are the amphoteric elements <clears throat> so in the periodic table they have given some uh, names for group wise elements right so if you consider group 1 elements right group 1 in the periodic table group 1 elements are known as alkali alkali metals alkali metals what are the alkali metals lithium sodium potassium rubidium cesium francium so these are alkali metals alkali means some kind of basic properties right then group 2 alkali earth metals alkali earth metals beryllium magnesium calcium strontium barium radium so these are alkali earth metals right if you go for the group number 14 elements they are known as coinage metals coinage metals coinage metals are copper silver and gold these are coinage metals 
right? Group number 16 elements are chalcogens. Chalcogens means what? Group number 16 elements, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, polonium. So these are the chalcogens, right? And then uh, group number 17, this is halogens. Halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. And group number 18 elements are known as noble gases. Or else uh, they consider rare gases. Right? Uh, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. So these are rare gases. Okay. Oh, sorry. This is co uh, group number 11. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Good. Very good. Group number 11. Okay. And remember, in the periodic table, the only group that existing all three states of matter is group number 17. Right? <clears throat> group number 17 elements, group number 17 contains all three states of matter. Solid, liquid and gases. Right? Because uh, fluorine and chlorine, <clears throat> both of them are gases. Bromine is a liquid. Iodine at the standard state, that's a solid. Astatine also solid. So therefore, group 17 contains all three states of matter. Right? Right. If you consider, <clears throat> if you consider period wise elements, period and four, four and six contain all three states of matter. Okay, because bromine and uh, mercury is there. Since bromine and mercury is there, period number four and six contain all three states of matter. Remember. So these are the main things you have to remember under the periodic table. Right, okay. So the last topic of the first unit is what? Atomic properties. Right. Under the atomic properties, uh, we are going to discuss about four atomic properties, right? So the number one is uh, radius, atomic radius. So the second one is <clears throat> what? First annihilation energy, energy, and the Third one is electron gain energy, electron gain energy, and the last one is electronegativity. 
Number four is electronegativity. So these are the <clears throat> four atomic properties we have to discuss. Atomic radius, first energy, electron gain energy, and the electronegativity. If we go for the atomic radius, let's go one by one. In order to measure the radius of atom, there are three methods. There are three main methods. Right? Number one is covalent radius. Number two is a Van der Waals radius. Van der Waals radius. Number three is metallic radius. Metallic radius. Right? Let's go one by one. What does mean by the covalent radius? Covalent radius. If you go for the covalent radius, right? Look at this one. <clears throat> covalent radius means when two atoms are combined through a covalent bond. So these are two nuclei. When uh, these two atoms are combined with covalent bond, right? We are taking the measurement between two atomic, two nuclei. This is D, right? So the radius, we can consider that radius of that atom. We consider this one as covalent radius. Covalent radius means uh, RC. This is equal to D over 2. So you may wonder that if we take the half of this uh, distance, this is not the exact radius, right? Exact radius of atom means what? The distance between the nucleus and the valence shell electron. So this is the valence shell, right? If we assume that atom is look like a sphere, so the exact radius is larger than the covalent radius. But what to do experimentally? So this is the accurate method that we can follow, right? So you have to understand that covalent radius is not exactly equal to the exact radius. Covalent radius is lesser than the exact radius. But anyhow, in order to measure the radius of elements, we are using covalent radius, right? Covalent radius is not equal to the exact radius. Covalent radius is lesser than the exact radius. When they are forming covalent bond, we are taking the distance between two nuclei and half of the distance is considered as the radius. Got it? Normally, covalent radius is measured uh, for the elements who are forming covalent bonds. For example, hydrogen covalent radius. Hydrogen, hydrogen atoms are connecting. Chlorine is forming to chlorine another atom. So that is also a way of finding the covalent radius, right? <clears throat> right, the second method the second method we can go here is what? Van der Waals radius. Van der Waals radius. Van der Waals radius means when the two atoms are very close to each other, they are not forming chemi uh, chemical bonds. The reason is actually they cannot form the chemical bonds. When they are not forming chemical bonds, we are taking the internuclear distance, right? So this is D. So the radius, this is known as Van der Waals radius. Van der Waals radius is denoted by Rv. This is equal to D over 2, right? Again, so this is not the exact radius, right? What to do, right? Some of the elements like helium, neon, they are not forming chemical bonds. So there should be a method to find out the radius. So therefore, we are taking 
the measurement when the two atoms are very close to each other and we take the half of the distance. So that is known as Van der Waals radius. Remember, Van der Waals radius, Van der Waals radius is greater than the exact radius of the atom. We are taking some measurements for the radius, radius, but those are not the exact values, right? So look at these two methods. Actually, these two methods are not 100% accurate. Covalent radius is lesser than the exact radius. Van der Waals radius is greater than the exact radius. So how we can say that they are accurate, 100% okay? accurate. But practically, these are the ways of finding the radius. We don't have any other methods. Let's go for the next method, metallic radius. A metallic radius is somewhat uh, uh, what acceptable than these two methods because accurate is very high in metallic radius. The thing in uh, metallic radius is In the metallic radius, the atoms are very close to each other. Right? These are the metal atoms. Right? <clears throat> now look at the distance, internuclear distance D, and we are taking the half of that one. So that is accurate. Right? If you take the metallic radius, metallic radius rm so that is d over 2 again here so that is exactly equal to the exact radius no issue right according to the diagrams you can understand right exact radius is equal to the metallic radius no issue right exact radius equal to the metallic radius so among the three methods, which one is more accurate, right? We know that exact radius is always uh, equal to the metallic radius. So this is greater than the covalent radius, lesser than the Van der Waals radius. So RM, metallic radius, is the most accurate radius we can take, right? So this is the three types of radius that we have to learn. Right. Okay. Now, look at this. Uh, we are going to discuss factors affecting to the factors affecting to atomic radius. What are the factors affecting to the atomic radius? Remember, there are two factors affecting to the atomic radius. Number one is shielding effect. Number two is nuclear charge. Shielding effect and the nuclear charge are the two factors affecting the radius. Right? Remember, shielding effect means 
uh, you know shield means what shield means protector kind of a protector if you consider an atom right so this is an atom so this is the valence shell electron <clears throat> right and these are the inner shell electrons these inner shell electrons are known as co electrons remember students atomic nucleus is positively charged and this electron is negatively charged this electron is attracted towards the atomic nucleus right this electron is attracted towards the nucleus but remember these co electrons right these blue color electrons are known as co electrons inner shell electrons are known as co electrons these electrons are protecting this electron valence shell electrons co electrons are protecting the valence shell electrons in order to reduce the nuclear attraction force felt by this electron can you understand remember this nuclear attraction force reduced by the number of co electrons inside the atom so that is known as shielding effect right so shield means kind of a army that is protecting this electron from the nuclear attraction force we know that if it is attracted to the nucleus the size of the atom is reducing that means when the size when the strength of the co electrons are increasing atomic radius is increasing if not radius is decreasing so we consider that we consider that shielding effect right how that shielding effect is affecting to the atomic radius atomic radius is directly proportional to the shielding effect shielding effect right when shielding effect increases definitely atomic radius increases right shielding effect is actually denoted by s how we can measure the shielding effect by counting the number of co electrons shall we uh, consider an example sodium and magnesium look at this uh, not sodium and magnesium let's take uh, mm. lithium and sodium what is the shielding effect of lithium we know that lithium's electron configuration is 1s to 2s1 so this is the valence shell electron right this is the valence shell electron so therefore 1s2 is the shielding effect of lithium that means two electrons are there right so that is the shielding effect sodium 11 electron configuration is 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s1 this is the valence shell electron last electron and other electrons are considered as co electrons so therefore co electrons are co electrons is the measurement of the shielding effect so therefore 10 electrons right so when the shielding effect is very high atomic radius is increase that's correct because we know that lithium sodium potassium rubidium cesium down to the group atomic radius are increasing right because shielding effect is increase can you understand so this is shielding effect atomic radius try to understand how that shielding effect is affecting the atomic radius when shielding effect increases atomic radius is increasing right the second factor we have to discuss is the nuclear charge right nuclear charge let's see how that nuclear charge is effecting to the radius nuclear charge denoted by z nuclear charge is denoted by z remember nuclear charge means nothing else number of protons number of protons nothing else number of protons right so how that nuclear charge affecting to the radius uh, let's compare uh, sodium and magnesium look at this one students so sodium's nuclear charge is 11 magnesium's nuclear charge is 12 plus 11 and plus 12 remember when the number of protons are high in the nucleus what will happen to the radius radius is going to reduce neither 
So more, all of the electrons are attracted towards the atomic nucleus. So therefore, when the nuclear power is very high, that means the attraction power of the nucleus is very high. What will happen to the radius? Radius is reducing. So therefore, we can always consider that magnesium has the least radius than sodium. Ne? Ah, therefore, you can understand that how is that nuclear charge is affecting to the radius. Nuclear charge is inversely proportional to the radius. Which means when a nuclear charge decreases on the atomic radius will increase. Try to understand. They are inverse proportional. Right, they are investment proportional. So shielding effect means number of co-electrons which are protecting the valence shell electrons. When the shielding effect is very high, radius is increasing. Nuclear charge means number of protons. When the number of protons or the nuclear charge increasing, atomic radius will reduce. So they are inverse proportional, right? And therefore, we can consider that <coughs> together. Together, I can show you that. Atomic radius is directly proportional to the shielding effect and inversely proportional to the nuclear charge. So this is the relationship you have to remember. Okay. And one more thing I, I, I want to remind you. Effective nuclear charge, ZEFF. Effective nuclear charge. Effective nuclear charge is uh, represented, is uh, used to, without considering these two factors separately, we can directly take new effective nuclear charge, right? Effective nuclear charge is equal to nuclear charge minus shielding effect. Minus shielding effect. Right. As an equation, we can tell that ZFF is equal to Z minus S. So this is the effective nuclear charge. So effective nuclear charge means a combination of these two factors, nuclear charge and shielding effect. Combination of two factors. Okay. Effective nuclear charge means combination of two factors, nuclear charge and the shielding effect. So, how we can uh, make the relationship between the effective nuclear charge and the radius? Very easy. <clears throat> effective nuclear charge is also same as nuclear charge. Without considering uh, these two factors separately, we can consider them together and tell that when the effective nuclear charge decreases, what will happen to the radius? Radius increases. Okay, so that's what you need to understand here. Try to understand. Okay, very, very important.
Right. Okay. Remember students, down to the group, down to the group, atomic radius increases, down to the group, atomic radius increases, right? Along a period, what will happen? Atomic radius is decreasing. Right. Along a period, from left to right, atomic radius decreases. So you can apply the theories you have learned, nuclear charge and uh, shielding effect, nuclear charge and everything. And uh, you can derive that one, okay? So you can, if you want, you can calculate the effect in nuclear charge. For example, I'll take uh, lithium and beryllium. For the lithium effect in nuclear charge, nuclear charge is three, number of co-electrons are two, therefore plus one. For beryllium, effect in nuclear charge can be calculated 4 minus 2, that is plus 2. So who has the highest effect in nuclear charge? Beryllium. So therefore, beryllium has the least radius. Lithium has the highest radius. So likewise, we can apply. So down to the group, we cannot apply the effect in nuclear charge. They are actually the dominant factor will be energy levels. Down to the group, we know that number of energy levels are increasing. So therefore, radius is increasing. Okay. And the next thing you have to remember, if you consider an element uh, with the cation, element and its cation, who has the highest radius always? Sodium and sodium plus, who has the highest radius? Definitely sodium, because it's removing electron. So therefore, sodium has the highest radius. If you consider an element and it's an ion, who has the highest radius? Chlorine and Cl minus. Definitely, it's the anion because it's gaining electrons. So therefore, it has the highest radius. Okay.
Right. So our next topic is uh, first ionization energy. First ionization energy means I1. I told you what does mean with ionization energy. Here mainly we are talking about how the ionization energy varies. Okay. There are two factors affecting to the ionization energy. Number one is a radius. And number two is electron configuration. Atomic radius and the electron configuration, right? So when you consider the ionization energy group wise, right? Down to the group, what will happen? <clears throat> we know that. Uh, down to the group, atomic radius is increasing. Okay? Atomic radius increases. Atomic radius increases down to the group. When atomic radius increases, ionization energy, I1, first ionization energy, decreases. Right? The reason is, here electron configuration won't dominate when we take in the ionization energy. The reason is, uh, if you consider group wise, just imagine lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium. Their valence configurations are same in S1. So this is 2S1, 3S1, 4S1, 5S1. Their valence configurations are similar. Right? So therefore, in uh, electron configuration won't dominate. Only the radius. Since the size is increasing, we can easily remove one electron from the atom. So therefore, Atomic radius increases, therefore ionization energy decreases. Very easy. So group wise, we can compare the ionization energy in this way. So the issue is with the what period wise elements. That's the issue here. Let's see. Right. Let's see what will happen with the period wise elements. So for the period wise elements, we know that actually uh, atomic radius is decreasing along a period. Ne? Along a period, atomic radius is decreasing. So that we are expecting ionization energy should be a uh, what? Increasing in this way. We can, if you draw the graph, we are expecting that ionization energy of the elements, right? Uh, let's consider lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. We are expecting that ionization energy should increase gradually in this way. Ne? Because atomic radius is decreasing. When the atomic radius decreases, ionization energy is increasing. Because we need to supply a lot of energy to remove electrons from the atom. But remember, this is not the variation. This is the expected variation. Okay. Along the period, this is not the co correct variation. Group wise, we can directly tell this is the way that ionization energy vary. But period wise, we can't tell that. Right. So I'm going to draw the ionization energy graph. Then you will understand how that elements ionization energy is depending on the electron configuration. Look at this one. This is very important. Highest ionization energy belongs to the helium because it has the stable configuration as well as the least radius. You have to remember this variation. No? 
a zigzag variation a zigzag variation right in this right look at the graph what you can see in the graph right this is helium lithium beryllium boron carbon nitrogen oxygen fluorine sodium magnesium aluminium silicon phosphorus sulfur chlorine argon potassium and calcium right so according to your resource book, hydrogen and uh, oxygen, both of them are in the same horizontal plane. Therefore, uh, let me consider hydrogen is here. This is hydrogen. Right? So you can see that some exceptional behavior shown by beryllium, nitrogen, magnesium, phosphorus. Normally, the typical variation that we are expecting ionization energy along a period that should increase gradually. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, gradually it should increase. In here also, we are expecting that sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon. We are expecting that they should gradually increase. Expected variations okay, along the period since the atomic radius uh, since the atomic radius is decreasing, we are expecting these kind of two variations. But that's not the case. We can see some exceptional behavior in beryllium nitrogen in magnesium phosphorus. Why is that? We know that beryllium has somewhat stable configuration. Beryllium 1s2, 2s2. Uh, all the orbitals are completely filled the electrons. So therefore stable. Nitrogen 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. That is half stable. Then if you consider magnesium 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. That is also stable. Phosphorus 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3, that is also somewhat stable. These configurations are somewhat stable. So that's why we are having some exceptional behaviors in the ionization energy. Right? Stable configurations. So this is the way that electron configuration is affecting to the ionization energies along a period. Try to understand. Okay. Very easy. Right. Okay. Never. So this is known as a zigzag variation, right? INSO energy zigzag variation. Very, very important. So uh, this is the first INSO energy graph. You have to remember. Uh, in the examination, if you ask to uh, find out the second NSA energy, third NSA energy graphs, or any questions they have given related to the second NSA energy or the third NSA energy, you should be able to derive that one also. Because that is really easy, not difficult. How? We know that students. <clears throat> According to this graph, 
if i consider the first ionization energy second ionization energy and the third ionization energy right highest highest in which group and the lowest in which group so using that actually you can identify that first ionization energy is always highest in the highest element is helium we know that one because the least radius the smallest radius and the stable configuration right so therefore we can consider that the highest first ionization energy belong to the group number 18 elements lowest first ionization energy always belong to the group number one elements mean lithium sodium potassium look at them they always at below ne? right so therefore the lowest first ionization energy belong to the group number one elements if you go for the second ionization energy, so you have to shift these graphs. You have to shift this graph to the left hand side. Then lithium will come here and ber beryllium will come here. Because second ionization of lithium means you are removing one electron of lithium. After removing one electron from lithium, now it's look like what? Helium. Now you are trying to remove an electron from helium. Is that possible? No, that's very difficult. So therefore, the highest in group number one, lowest in group number two. Third dynamization energy, highest in group two, lowest in group 13. So likewise, you should be able to derive the second and third ionization energies as well. Got it? That's the way. Right, so uh, that is all about the ionization energy you have to know. So those things are also very important, okay? Right. Now let's go for the electron gain energy. Now let's go for the electron gain energy. The next atomic property is electron gain energy. Electron gain energy is denoted by Eg, right? So the electron gain energy, first of all, we can define the first electron gain energy, right? How we can define that one, very easy. So uh, same as in the ionization energy, we are considering gaseous state element. It's gaining one electron to form X minus gaseous state and higher. Right? So the energy associated with this one is known as first electron gain energy. Right? Yeah, we didn't do this part. I have to provide you a recording, but doesn't matter. We can just go through these things. Okay? These things are very easy. Electron gain energy means the minimum energy, that means uh, the energy associated uh, with gaining electron. Okay, so this X atom has gained one electron. So the energy associated with that is known as first electron gain energy. Right, first electron gain energy. So remember, most of the time, the electron gain energy is actually a negative value. Right, negative value. 
uh, for the sum elements, for the few elements, no need, no need. Don't write anything in the tutorial. So for that one, I'll give you the separate recording. So therefore, don't worry. So now just listen, will you, right? This is kind of a revision, right? So don't write anything. Just listen, right? Uh, most of the time, electron gain energy is negative value. Electron gain energy is a negative value. That means exothermic, right? Exothermic. Exothermic means they are releasing energy. Exothermic means releasing energy. Releasing energy, they are for negative. Okay. In energetics unit, we are going to learn this on unit number five. Endothermic. Endothermic means they are absorbing the energy energy they are absorbing energy so that is positive huh? positive so most of the time this electron gain energy is actually what exothermic they are not the endothermic exothermic right some endothermic values also there right i'll consider some examples then you will understand look at this one example chlorine Chlorine's electron gain energy value is minus 349 kilojoules per mole. That's an exothermic. So this is the highest value, right? That means the highest electron gain energy value is belong to chlorine, right? Always remember that one. And uh, remember for beryllium-like elements, look at this one. Beryllium has gained one electron, is forming beryllium minus. This is positive. 340 kilojoules per mole, right? Look at this one. That means in order to give one electron for the beryllium, we have to supply energy. That is difficult, right? Positive. Positive means we have to do a work. Negative means it releases the energy. Positive means we have to supply energy, absorb the energy means that means we have to supply. Understood? So therefore, beryllium, remember these three elements, beryllium, nitrogen, and magnesium, they have always positive electron gain energy values. Positive electron gain energy values. Okay. They have always positive electron gain energy values. Remember. Try to understand. Beryllium, nitrogen, and magnesium always having positive electron gain energy values. Positive electron gain energy values. If they have negative values, we consider that one as exothermic. Right? Releasing energy. If it is a positive value, we consider that one as endothermic, absorbing the energy. Right. Okay. Remember students, always, always, second electron gain energy, that means EG2 is a positive value. The reason is, just imagine X minus gas gaining one electron as forming X2 minus, this is always, EG2 is always greater than zero. The reason is after gaining one electron, this is negatively charged. For the negatively charged one, you are trying to give another electron. Will it accept or repel? Electron, direct electron, repulsion force will create neighbor. Right? After giving one electron, this is negatively charged. For this negatively charged electron, you are trying to give another electron. Is that possible? No. Right? It's not possible. So therefore, try to understand this is what positive value. Second electron gain energy is always a positive value. Okay. So that is all about you have to remember regarding the electron gain energy.
right so the last topic of the unit is what electronegativity very very important huh? electronegativity is very very important <clears throat> even though that is the last topic that is very important because this is affecting to the other two units also second unit and third electronegativity what does mean by the electronegativity Remember students, electronegativity means, just imagine hydrogen and chlorine has formed a bond, right? So one of the electrons will pull the electrons, these bonding electrons toward itself because of the ability. So kind of an ability to pull the electron, right? Actually here the most electronegative atom is chlorine. Chlorine is pulling the electrons from hydrogen. That means these bonding electron pairs are attracted towards the chlorine atom. So that ability, that capability is known as what? Electronegativity. Electronegativity means what? The ability to pull the electrons, bonding electron pairs from a bond to itself is known as what? Electronegativity. Okay. So this is very important concept. You have to remember when you go for the second unit and third unit, structure and bonding and the chemical calculation, right? So what is the definition for the electronegativity? Ability to attract the bonding electron pairs when they are connected to each other, when, when it is connected to another element, right? So in order to measure the electronegativity, there was a scientist known as Linus Pauling, right? Linus Pauling has introduced a scale to measure this uh, electronegativity that is known as Pauling scale. Pauling scale. According to the Pauling scale, the most, that means the highest electronegative atom in the periodic table is fluorine, F. Right? So, when, uh, when an element is connected, may combine to the fluorine atom, right? Remember, fluorine will pull the electrons, right? According to the Pauling scale, these are the values they have given. Hydrogen, uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, boron, aluminium, gallium, indium, thallium, Carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, lead. Nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, uh, what? antimony, bismuth. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, polonium. Fluorine, chlorine. Bromine, iodine, astatine. For the noble gases, actually, we do not consider the electronegativity values because they are not forming chemical bonds, right? Electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.1. Lithium is 1.0. Sodium is 0 0.9. Potassium is 0 0.8. Rubidium is 0 0.8. Cesium is 0 0.7. Beryllium 1.5. Magnesium 1.2, calcium 1.0, barium is 0 0.9. So boron is 2.0, 2.5, 3.0, 3.5, 4.0. Right? And this is 1.5, 1.8, 2.1, and this is 2.5, 3.0. We are going to discuss a short method for this one. Don't worry, in the paper class, we are going to discuss to remember a short method to remember this one. For now, let's uh, analyze the values, how they are behaving, okay? So the highest electronegative element in the periodic table is what? Fluorine. 
that means fluorine will pull the electrons bonding electron pairs in a bond than the others and the second highest one is oxygen third highest one is nitrogen and chlorine but remember exactly even though they have given 3.0 3.0 here if you go for the second decimal point second decimal point is highest in chlorine and that means chlorine has the highest electron negativity but according to the polling skill they are same right and you can see that uh, some elements have uh, similar values for example look at silicon germanium tin they have similar values hydrogen phosphorus they have similar values there are so many elements having the similar values right uh, can we analyze how that electronegativity varying along a period along the period electronegativity is increasing right? we can see that and down to the group electronegativity is decreased so therefore actually these elements actually are forming are having high electronegativity values than the others right okay so this is the whole theory part that we have discussed how to discuss in the first bit i think i have discussed all the things didn't uh, i didn't miss anything i discussed all the theory parts okay